Hey guys, I'm Brent. I'm Lila, and you can find us on the web at www.braintrustlive.com. And we, once again, bring you one of our favorite past guests and also um, somebody who I feel like is going to have lots of fun thoughts on <laughs> the, the craziest news week in American history. The founder of Spread the Vote, Kat Calvin, is with us again. Welcome. Yay. I'm I'm always, it's so nice to be here because I like refresh maddeningly until you guys come out every week. So last week, for me, the most stressful thing was not the coup. It was not all the stuff that happened. It was that there was no BTL uh, <laughs> until ah. like, Thursday. And I was oh. in a constant panic attack. Like, where are they? So oh, that's so like, nice of you. I know. Lila said at the beginning of that podcast that we did record on Thursday about the coup. She was like, we told you last week that we would be coming to you later in the week. And I was like, no, we actually did not do that. <laughs> I was like, I guess I just told certain people that and they are now upset like, that we were not able right. to do it. As, an act as a podcast, we told no one that we were doing right. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's true. Also, because we... Um, we had not done a, you know, we, we did like a free form podcast the week before that. So, you know, the, the last week we did record the end of the year. And so we did our end of the year extravaganza. That was nothing of the sort. <laughs> our extravaganza. Well, which I was think just you tweeted it. I think you tweeted it. Cause this was an international crisis because my friend, Daniel, Hey Daniel, he listens to you guys in soul and loves you. And he was tweeting me and he, you know, they're like a day ahead. He's like, where's BTL? And I was like, I don't know. I'm freaking out. I'm <laughs> <laughs> and he was freaky and then he was like oh wait they tweeted that they weren't doing the podcast oh. until after george on tuesday but i okay. in the greatest feat for mental health of all time but have been off twitter for over a year and i was like well, i didn't know wow. yeah can so you i had to be told by someone in korea because like this, <laughs> seriously this podcast has like global implications <laughs> It's so nice to know. I had no idea. I know. That's like <laughs> made my day. Yeah. I assumed that well, Carlin Nordstrom and Kat Calvin were our two listeners. I was going to say, oh, like we were writing the UN. We were like, <laughs> United Nations, get on this. Get most of our People listener to feedback. <laughs> Carlin Nordstrom and Kat Calvin. Yeah. So it's oh, exciting yes. to know about the ripple effects. Yeah. Um, so we're definitely, we talked about the coup already, but we're definitely going to do it again. Just right. so. Yeah. Nobody Everybody knows that. because we want to hear what Kat has to say. And also like there's been updates from that, but anyway. yeah, well, it turns out it's um, even worse than we knew during the coup cast. So, I mean, I we have to, we have to bring it back up. We're starting though with something exciting. <laughs> um, we found out this week that Elon Musk has now become the richest person in the world. And yes. on the Hello. tail of that announcement, Elon Musk being a COVID denier, being a just general fringe crazy person, being a person who decided to name his child a fake, weird series of symbols. <laughs> the whole thing kind of inspired me to come up with my own uh, fringe economic theory. <laughs> now, you know, if you're a longtime listener, that we don't really believe in the economy <laughs> as a concept. So coming up with economic theories is not usually what we do on this podcast, but Brent has been doing deep reading into modern monetary theory. Mm -hmm. He's like a Stephanie Kelton fanboy. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we talk about MMT a lot on this podcast. And this is mm -hmm. sort of an MMT adjacent idea. It's a sister it's theory. It's definitely, it's inspired by MMT, but it's a little bit more specific. I was just thinking, like Elon Musk has like $200 billion. I would say that 199 billion of those is money that even if you spent 24 hours a day spending money, you would be unable to use. Yeah. It's, so it's not even real money. It's just like been taken out of circulation, which is it's also- yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's theoretical money. But that is also taking money out of circulation and then replacing it with other money is also what the treasury does. So I was just like, instead of saying we're taxing these very wealthy people, instead of framing it that way, what if we just calculated how much of their money they couldn't spend using human brain time and <laughs> recirculated that money into the regular economy and just assumed that it didn't matter because the money is parked and going nowhere. And so it's not even real money. And so we could keep replenishing the economy for regular people with the money that Elon Musk is not, is not trickling down from Elon Musk's fortune via government programs, via UBI, like via direct payments to people so that that money is in people's hands and not Elon Musk's storage, theoretical storage facility. It's, not, it's mm -hmm. like an internet storage facility because it's not even real cash, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and he'll never know because he can't spend it. He can't even find most of it probably. And it's, it's an amount that is like, 
physically unspendable. So like it's not in circulation anyway. So what if we just recirculate it, use it to pay for all the stuff that Stephanie Kelton is just like, we shouldn't worry about the deficit, let's just pay for it. And it's sort of like taxing them without us having to call it that. So we don't have to worry about their opinions on That's it. That's what I was going to say. I'm like, there, there is a there is a method for doing this that we have just been choosing not to do. Right. But that's what, like, politically, it's, called taxing. It's, it's, called taxing. politically yeah. it's been untenable to tax them. But what if we just essentially decide that the money that they have taken out of circulation is money that we can put back into circulation based on our own feelings, since we made up the monetary system anyway, and we just don't call it taxing them, and we let them believe that they have $200 million because they can't do anything with it. Like, calculate how much they could reasonably spend of that money <laughs> on, like, non-theoretical concepts, and then just like put the back, put the rest of it back in people's hands. Yeah. That's my fringe theory. So this is the this is the Brewster's Millions economic theory. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, and I works. wait the what? It's the what? The Brewster's Millions. Have you wait, please tell me you've seen Brewster's Millions. No. I have. Oh okay. I haven't. first of all immediately <laughs> sit down and watch every Richard Fryer movie ever. But it's uh -huh. this movie about a guy who I am has the opportunity to inherit like some untold, untold millions, but in order to do so, he has to spend a wild amount of money. This movie came out in like the 80s. I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's like you have to spend $10 million in 24 hours in order to inherit $100 million, right? And then the whole movie is about how hard it actually is. Right. To spend yeah. I, that much it, money. You can't in spend. one day. Right. It's like so a, that exactly thing. It's like you have all this money, you can't spend it but you have to spend it, right? Or we actually, I, I mean, I guess in this case, we would be Brewster and we'd be like, look, Elon. First of all, I, I have a lot of questions about Elon Musk's money, not where it came from because it's his parents, but <laughs> where, like he's not selling that many Teslas. If you ever, if we ever leave Los Angeles again, cause I know here it feels like everybody owns a Tesla, but once you leave Los Angeles County and it's been a very long time, God, actually, I'm not exaggerating. It's been a really long time. That like you realize, like, wait, everyone doesn't own a Tesla. I have not, no. seen not actually one single that. Tesla in right. probably three months. Like Franklin, and they're also yeah. all like <laughs> right. it, the Teslas that like got initially uh, sold as part of like the original Tesla rollout are all already falling completely apart. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, <laughs> they're they're not cars you should be buying right now. But like, it's not profitable. SpaceX is not profitable at all. They could no. barely get anything off the ground. So I, I, where, I don't know enough about Elon Musk to know where his money is coming from, but it's not coming from his cars or his spaceships. No, I, and, and how he managed what to else acquire, does he have? like, I understand well, how Jeff Bezos has made so much money during the, during yes. the pan pandemic, because he's in a direct sales business that is like a mail order thing. Like I get that. Yeah. It's not great, but I get it. I don't know what Elon Musk could have done to accumulate this amount of money in this time, given no. that the markets have been lunacy. Yeah. So it's not like he made it in the stock market or something like that. Well, he might. I don't know who is buying, are, are Teslas flying off the shelves right now? No, because I don't I, think they are. I mean, and there yeah. haven't been any like IPOs that have been so big that it right. could be like, oh, maybe he invested in an Airbnb. Yeah. Like nobody made trillions off of Airbnb's IPO, right? Like, so like I right. actually, and I look, listeners, I, Carla probably I have not googled this so like right. don't yeah. write me but like I honestly don't know I was like I sitting and I was thinking about it and I was not googling because I don't care that much but it's like I don't actually understand where his money has come from I but Lila back to your French theory I actually think like most Lila's theories I mean look she sold me on the whole anti-metric system thing or her, she's actually it's not anti-metric system it's a merger of the it's a critical system. it's critical of the metric system as a sufficient measurement yes. tool and, and this is a, a fully anti-metric podcast we are this is this entire podcast slate is currently we're in an anti-metric zone so just beware I'm in the i'm in the 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 metric system would be acceptable if we change these things because we need a foot basically right. but like so along yeah. with that i think your french economic theory makes a ton of sense yeah. You know yeah. what it's better than? It's better than giving people $1,200 like a month into a pandemic and then 10 months later being like, here's $600. <laughs> yes. That should be okay. And only giving it to people who like desperately need it to right. eat and not to people who could spend it on like takeout. 
and make right, who could actually afford business. to spend it on local business in a right. principal like, way. I had already mentally spent that six hundred dollars at Stanley's wet bar or wine bar. It's been so long since <laughs> I've been to my favorite wine place. I don't remember what it's called. I do miss it, but it's like <laughs> I had you've forgotten. That's how long it's been. Like, I'm going to buy a $200 box of wine and a couple pairs of shoes. I'm, I'm going to lift the economy. And then I found out I'm not getting $600. Yeah. And so I can't lift anything. It's, so, I also feel like any, like if you could just indiscriminately hand out Elon Musk's money, then it, it would be trickling down. But also like I said this to Brent at the beginning, you know, in the $1,200 era where I was like, the people who can afford to actually spend that money also will actively spend it as opposed to save it. It's not just that they can afford to spend it on things that lift the economy, but like they can afford to spend it now. <laughs> like they can Many afford- of them will buy Teslas. That's right. So right, exactly. anything this Elon Musk even richer. could help Elon because right Elon now not a lot of people right. outside of LA buying Teslas, but yeah. I guarantee you that there are a lot of people in Miami who if we handed them some small chunk of Elon Musk's imaginary right. money, immediately, first thing they do is buy a Tesla. Well, and yeah. also that this way we can keep circling the money back to the people. Right. Cause we could do this every, every year we could be like, oh, here's an amount of the money that he made this year that he also can't spend. Let's circ circulate that back into the economy. And then more people can buy Elon Musk's products, but him making all that money doesn't actually stop us from eating. It doesn't like take There's resources out of the economy. Problem with you. There's only one problem with your theory. Yes. <laughs> It's that we live in a country where you have to earn the right to live. So we could never I know. do this. <laughs> I know oh, that's the problem with all my theories is that they're all predicated on the idea that like humans like inherently deserve like the right to live. <laughs> Which is, oh, it's wild. I cannot. I don't know how I became this way. <laughs> like, oh, people should just be able to live without a job. Like what? It's, it's a, such a it's wild, so wild concept to me. That yeah. even in the nineties when that, even in the 90s, you had to describe yourself as a socialist if you believed that. And in the 90s, people did not like it when you called yourself a socialist. Yeah. I would know because I antagonized many people in the 90s doing that. Um, but like th there was, was like 12. a time you had to describe yourself as like a fringe radical <laughs> to believe that <laughs> at the time that I realized that that was a thing that everyone should believe. And people haven't caught up. Yeah. I don't know. I, well, I think to TikTok do. has caught up. T TikTok, TikTok is oh TikTok they're all like Marxist, Marxist now. At this point. Yeah, I, like it's actually kind the best. of wild. I I, no. I I'm I know too I, old to be on there, but I'm it makes me feel good. Exactly, I'm I was gonna say I, I'm the target audience, and I just like scroll, and I realize that all like ninety percent of TikTok is people talking about how capitalism sucks, and I'm like, yeah. all right, well I can go to sleep now. It's perfect bedtime viewing. Wait, right, you're on for sleep. you're on for how many minutes a day, Kat? I literally cannot handle more than 10 minutes of TikTok. It's the now. craziest oh. thing I've ever heard in my life. I was going to say, I'm going to need- people could be on there. I'm going to need all your tips hours. and tricks. I yeah. literally- It's so it's... boring. Like if our, there's like five minutes when there's a lot of really interesting videos. And then the rest of the time, it's just people copying those videos. And I'm there to watch all <laughs> yeah, same. the hours of those people copying yeah. it. I, um, I, I honestly don't think I've ever spent more than 12 minutes on TikTok at a time. I feel like- Talking about TikTok is a good transition into our next story because if there's one person who has the world's most boring TikTok, he's our new senator from the state of Georgia, John Ossoff. Oh God! Doing the worst on TikTok. I of mean, almost anyone. Oh right no now. one. It is hard to imagine making an effort to even exist on TikTok and the like with a staff and like having the outcome be as boring as John Ossoff's TikTok is. I honestly <laughs> think that if we proposed an amendment to the constitution that you could not be in Congress if you or the person you chose to marry chooses muesli as their favorite <laughs> snack, we would we get have... that amendment done tomorrow. It would turn yeah. out that changing the constitution is super easy. <laughs> right. So easy. Like, yeah, I and also his TikTok managed to make w Raphael Warnock look silly. Just by ex just by being on it, he tried to do one where it was like two cool guys like hanging out before a rally or whatever because they had done all that campaigning together. And I was like, all this does is make me dislike Warnock, who I have been standing since the beginning of the Senate races. And instead, like somehow, it changed my opinion of anyone who like came across like sort of crossed paths with the Ossoff TikTok. Like it was it made everyone look bad because it was boring. It made Warnock look boring and. Warnick is doing ads with an adorable beagle. I mean, he gets things, you know? 
But it's a like, seeping infectious boredom. Yes. Like anything. I mean, it's like a the nightmare. COVID boredom. All he has to do is breathe that boredom in your vicinity. It's, and all of a sudden you become bored too. He's the Borg of boredom. It, it is not lost. It should not be lost on anyone that the list of people to thank for John Ossoff's win cannot <laughs> include John Ossoff himself. Literally yeah. everyone else. Donald Trump is higher on the list of thanks than John Ossoff himself. Well, Trump oh, right. really worked hard to get them elected. He really, he really did. did. I mean, he, taking like an unwinnable basket, unwinnable candidate like John, like that was an unwinnable race. I mean, John Ossoff is like running. I think maybe I said this last uh, the last podcast, but he's like running the absence of a person for office. It's, I mean, <laughs> it's it's like yeah. running somebody who does. It's like running a ghost for office. So like the fact that Trump was able to turn that into a like a yeah. compelling inspiring story is really credit to his terrible yeah. media skills <laughs> <clears throat> well but Nothing. trump really did i mean uh, you know uh, by trying to completely undermine the georgia election and then also uh, everything that he was doing to uh, like i mean the i mean the turnout there we knew that the turnout was high because like three million people had voted before election day which was already a record for you know, a runoff there. And so Republicans knew that they were going to have to sort of like go big on the day of, and it just didn't materialize. I mean, these guys really won because, uh, I mean, uh, they won for a million different reasons, but certainly in large part because of depressed Republican turnout mm -hmm. on election day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, they just Absolutely. didn't, they didn't have enough votes on election day and to, it is to catch up hard. from what Democrats had already banked. It's hard to out depress Democratic turnout in a runoff. In a runoff election. I mean, you yeah, have got is. to work at that. That does not come. But, but they did. I mean, well, that's really where my admiration for the GOP, you know, is at this moment. In so many ways, we want to get to the coup, is that they're really becoming Democrats and then that they're getting really good at losing really winnable races. <laughs> yeah, just like snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. Jaws of victory. And that's yep. that used to be us. And lately, because even the third, I mean, he did the same thing in Georgia that he did in the, the election yep. when he spent six months telling people don't vote by mail and then was shocked, shocked that Republicans <laughs> didn't vote by mail. It's like, well, yep. he, you really could have won this, right? Like it was close enough. Trump could have won. He just, he keeps losing it yep. for himself. But I think also to, uh, you know, your point about the, how good the turnout was for a special election, I think you have to give so much credit to all of the, again, which the, you know, the same people that we're giving the credit to for right. to, flipping to it blue in the presidential election. But to non-Democrats, you have to give right, it all the, the activists who were on the ground, who were right, not the activists yes, on the ground, who got people out because, go ahead, Absolutely, sorry. they worked really hard, but again, I think you can look at 18, right, where activists were on the ground. I mean, my org was on the ground this right. year, on the ground. Then, like, people were working like crazy. There were record record turnout, et cetera. But the Republicans were organized enough to steal it, right? right? Which is a thing they are good at doing. Yeah. Yeah. So the activists Famously. worked really hard, but it was a close race. This was a race that was won both by activists working really hard and by Trump and the GOP just absolutely throwing it in the trash. Yep. Because actually, yeah. not, interestingly, neither of these races ended up being close. Yeah, I mean, they're close by they're standards close of like- They're close-ish. Right, but I mean, in terms of like- by Georgia standards though. They're right, Less but they're both, the they're, they're both outside of recount territory. And I think like, I, I guess I mean, like in the sense that like, as you're watching it that night, you're sort of like, oh God, here we go again, kind of, you know, but it was like, yeah. it ended up, I, I mean, I think Warnock is ahead by like almost a hundred thousand votes, I think. Right. I mean, like it ended up yeah, his lead ultimately got... not being, you know, a real, it ended up not being that close. Of people who tried to call or text me on that day of the day, the you know, the results to asked me why I thought Ossoff was underperforming Warnock. And I was like, are you asking me this really? Right, that's a real question. Did you just send them his TikTok? That's, yeah, this, <laughs> this is a muesli. muesli. One word, muesli. <laughs> muesli. This I was why. like, I, I mean, there I think were factors beyond what John Ossoff himself could have even controlled because obviously uh, Loeffler is also just like an actual like known criminal. And right. he had already been elected. But, he, but he was that, like a well, that's the thing elected too. before. And she's a carpetbagger right, too. She's that, barely from Georgia. When has, yeah. that, when has that ever stopped? But that's, I was like. On either side, yeah, especially Republican, Republican from losing. Yeah. I mean, that's, Sometimes I was. It helps. I, I was not 
banking that that on that having any effect on anything. I think the one thing that probably did is that Luffler had never actually been elected to anything. So no yeah, one she'd actually never won knew an what there. Yeah. her deal was. But yeah. at the same time, this was a race where it was like so easy to go in and vote a party line. So I, but I love that there were that many people that either could only stomach voting for one in one of the races or split their votes, which is just like, like what a wild choice but people you know I mean, yeah, imagine making us, that so what can you do <laughs> i mean i mean look lucy mcbath every time someone asks me about awesome i just say totally lucy mcbath that will tell right. you everything you need to know about him yeah it, the anyone the he is like the absence of running someone who can actually run so like anyone else mm -hmm. if he could win then anyone else could have won by more which i think we saw oh. we saw because we're not totally yes. so in any case, it also didn't help that Trump made all these threatening phone calls to the Secretary of State and Elections Inspectors in Georgia that just before <laughs> to try to get them to, quote, find the 11,000 votes he needed to win. And the obvious best part of all of this was that it fit perfectly into the rent song uh, 525,000. Right. <laughs> and so people were able to set the call, which was released to the Washington Post. Raffensperger's office obviously leaked it. Um, it was uh, leaked to the Washington Post and then people set it to music. And that was like yeah. a meme we all got to enjoy as everyone went in to vote. Well, I think so. he knew that he was gonna have to tape record it because uh, I think there were like reports that like he had tried to call Raffensperger's office like 18 times over the span of the last two months or something like that. I mean, like he, he knew what this call was about. The call <laughs> is like a real roller coaster. It's like right. half of those like old timey mobster type threats that Trump made in the Ukraine call. Yeah. Where he like doesn't ever threaten anything specific. He just makes threats that sound like movie threats where you're like, well, I know he's threatening me, but I can't figure out with what. Well, and it's also and then, just like Trump riffing also. Because yes. like, I think, didn't he speak for like 59 out of the like 63 yes. minutes or something like that? Like some yes. insane yes. amount. I mean, Until it's literally... they finally hung up the phone. They were finally like, all right, Mr. President, <laughs> we're done here. Like, well, you have to hang up on the president. <laughs> uh. <laughs> and Ravensburger kept having to respond because he kept just going on about all his crazy conspiracy theories. And Raffensperger, who is a Republican, was in the position of having to be like, you know, yeah. the facts you have, Mr. President, are wrong. <laughs> right. <laughs> Your and data is incorrect. Just like saying no, like one way, you know, it was just sort of like, in a word, no. Right. <laughs> well, that's, at one point, Trump literally said, so what are we going to do here, folks? I only need 11,000 votes. Fellas, I need 11,000 votes. Give me a break. Right. And Republicans in Georgia are not... <laughs> You know, people who are like generally doing the right thing when it comes not to not unafraid to steal an election. Like, uh, no, they're so. Um, I mean, even Kemp, who stole the election for which for he himself, in was like, "This is this is too much." <laughs> I well, I, it's like, like I'm, I'm all for stealing elections, but this is extreme. It, you know, amateur hour election theft. Kemp, yep. Kemp's election theft was much more sophisticated than this. Like you shouldn't steal an election, but if you're going to steal an election, this can't be how you do it. Right, it can't be at the well, end just is, like re <laughs> uh, recalculating them and then just like getting a different result on the fourth time that you've counted them. <laughs> right. Right. But this is then this is just more proof of how for, for some reason Democrats keep thinking Trump is playing third dimensional chess. Right. It's like no, he's a, a total idiot just flying by the seat of his pants, no idea what he's doing. He's he was an idiot. thrilled. I know we haven't moved to the coup yet, but he was thrilled at the coup because he didn't plan that. He didn't know that was going to no. happen. Well, that's he just, have and that the capability to plan something like that. I know. Well, and interestingly, that is actually why I have been here. A lot of people are sort of like not calling that a coup any longer. I actually was listening to um, uh, I, something with Kyle Kulinski the other day, and he was like, I've just been calling it a diet coup because, like, obviously their intention was to do a coup, but also, like, a coup implies like a level of planning. Often, sometimes right. someone from the military right. is involved. There's people on the inside who are like, helping people make the moves to like, and also like the intention is to actually take over the government. Right, and then like govern they're after that. Those things. Right, they're, right. Like, it's an accidental coup. I mean, they've been <laughs> interviewing some of the people who've now been arrested and charged, and they are, I think, legitimately shocked that they're being arrested for something because they were just, they're just going with the flow and they're right. like, yeah. yeah, let's break in. We hate these people. Yeah. And literally they're like, Sedi that was sedition? Like, so <laughs> what did you think? Well, they didn't think. These no, people they didn't. don't think. No. Like, and that's and anyone who, and Lila and I, yesterday, I, I rage texted because someone wrote this absolutely unhinged 
200 tweet thread Seth about how yes about how <laughs> Trump's speech was this brilliant like psychological like, he was like, uh, like he was like dog <laughs> whistling with like secret code to them it was and this that- whole like manipulation of the people to get them to act and he was trying to get the military he was apparently trying to get the military to become part of this coup 15 minutes before they stormed the capital because that's how coups work and it was this whole unhinged thing and I was just like none of these people know what they're doing they went inside and smeared feces literally smeared well, feces inside of the capital they were they're all really surprised they're being arrested and fired they can't believe it I also have a thought just based on like a lifetime of attending protests in DC which is the the constant calls against Antifa are they stole a term that left-wing activists use to describe a, a certain kind of protester like a certain kind of activist that you see at protests elsewhere but also in DC a lot where you know you would be at like a George Bush kind of protest or you know mad at the Iraq war or whatever and you'd be like oh I see Antifa's here and what you meant was the kids who like wear all black and wear bandanas around their faces even though there's no pandemic and like are exact are they're usually you know the first people to stir shit if someone's going to but also like if you get t- pepper sprayed like you should ask them because they will have milk like they're prepared. <laughs> and so I feel like the one thing I noticed and my mother commented on this as well about the protesters that were breaking in the thing that like made clear that this was just like a, a chaos of silliness and total amateur hour was none of them had covered their faces. And the first mm-hmm. thing that you have to yep. do if you are about to commit civil disobedience on a level where you could be arrested and charged is you cover your fucking face. <laughs> I mean, they didn't just not cover their they, like, faces. Announced they announced themselves. They posted on social media and live streamed on right. verified accounts. Live streamed it without their face cover. They walked in and then that West Virginia legislator who like walked in and was oh like, God. Brian Lewis is in the building. Right. <laughs> I mean, and this is why, like, they should absolutely be arrested and charged with a lot of things, including just, like, rank stupidity. But I, uh, they, it, this was not an attempted coup. They had no plan. Well, there no. were no little factions backing. that had plans. But as somebody, I was reading about this online, who somebody had been, like, embedded kind of, like, in the parlor chat about this. And what they noted was, in order to believe the conspiracy theories that were driving all of this, you have to kind of suspend disbelief for, like, a certain amount of just, like, logical thought patterning. And because of that even the plans that were laid usually had one huge logical lapse in them that was like fatal to the plan because (laughs) they were not able to see reality correctly. And so they would assume that once they were in the Capitol that they were already in the tunnels or, you know, some of them had maps of the tunnels but they didn't know how to get there. I feel like that's- None of them, like, cause there was no recon, right? That nobody cased the joint. So not a single person in the Capitol had ever been in the Capitol before, which again, not how you Which is wild because you can take a tour of the Capitol. It's free. <laughs> I have been there. If someone <laughs> Guys, wanted is, to this... find out where Chuck Schumer's office was, they could have taken a tour of the Capitol and known immediately. This is the story of the the Trump supporter, though. Uh, mm-hmm. Like, yeah. yes. Uh, I mean, and this is one, and now they're planning another one. And this is just like the most memeable revolution of all time. It's like, first of all, stop planning your coups on platforms where every journalist in America is on them. Like I was just reading a Washington Post article about the next thing they're planning. The next coup plan. You're doing it wrong, but they still don't have any like actual, the people, you know, we should have led this. The people who had the plans to kidnap Gretchen Whitmer, they had plans, they had supplies. Well, people brought plans and supplies to kidnap Mike Pence. They just (laughs) didn't know how to reach him because they didn't know which way the Senate chamber was. Yeah, they they snapped that picture of the guy with a bunch of zip ties. Yeah, there were a few people with zip ties. ties. Right. There were people who had maps of the tunnels on them. They were obsessed with getting into the tunnels and blocking everyone's exits, but they they couldn't, they never made it. They couldn't find the tunnels. Like, (laughs) the tunnels are accessible from other buildings. Like, the tunnels are... If you I mean, know where the, the tunnels are, it's easy to get to the tunnels. Right. <laughs> that's the, right. the whole point of the tunnels is that they connect everything. Having, right. unfortunately, been, right. lo- been lost in those things more than once looking for ice cream, which they have. <laughs> <laughs> Do they have so different dots? Like, there's, there's no ice no. cream here. There's just pipes and like offices of people no one cares. Like, right, and sometimes you take a turn and you're like tunnel. in a trash room and you're like, I did not yes. intend <laughs> to end up in the trash room here. It's like, oh, I'm going to die here. No one will ever find me. Right, like it'll be you and one like janitor in yeah. lost in like a room somewhere and you're like i don't know how to get out the janitor's been to... getting paid for 50 years but hasn't managed to clean anything because he's just right. lost in the tunnels <laughs> <laughs> in any case so oh, no man. it's definitely i i we need a, a word that is not cool because it was 
Well, and it was and attempted it, coup. Accidental, I guess. I think was it? there were elements of it know. that were an attempted coup. Yeah. There were elements that were intending to kidnap and p- potentially kill legislators, including yeah. Mike Pence. Yeah. And that right, but I mean, I intend to be a billionaire, but I don't actually right. have any right. like functional actionable. Way to get there. Right. Yeah. Uh-huh. Right. Well, that's why yeah, I kind I mean, of liked. That's why I liked Kyle Kulinski's um, diet coup because yeah, it's sort of a diet coup, which isn't an actual term. So like that, but I mean, like it's sort of yeah. But this it, wasn't it feels... an actual coup, so it works out perfectly. <laughs> right. I've been calling it a, an insurrection. Yeah. Well, it's definitely that. Right. right. I mean, and yeah, I feel like that's right. a blanket term for what happened. Yeah. Yeah. I also some it's, for some reason feel like that almost like gives it too much because you hear about insurrections like sort of throughout history and we will certainly study this in history in the future probably but something about calling it an insurrection almost like validates it in some way to, in my brain think, it almost makes it sound like a real thing when it was just like so fun like I think that, that, that doesn't give finding, credit to the, like insane haphazardness of it. I, I think that what we're finding though is as more reports about what were going on what was going on inside the Capitol come out that it was e- much more violent and insane than we even thought on the day. Yeah. Like we are starting to hear about the actions of some of the people that were not live streaming themselves or that were not of it, you know, that were not in the news um, yeah. on the day. And like there was, the, you know, th- there were actual like violent and, um, and, and certainly attempted coup-like actions that were being take- taken by people that weren't like QAnon shaman. Um, right. that I think we can reasonably describe as an attempted coup. I don't yeah, think yeah, yeah. they were being stupid, but I mean, I it think- It just wasn't as, a collect, the collective right. group was it not- It was sort of like an Occupy coup where they were like, let's all have a coup, but everyone was just like, you do whatever you think would make a coup happen. So they all just like <laughs> came in together and they were like, let's have a coup. We all agree the goal is a coup, but no one has discussed strategy. And because right. we weren't communicating with oh each other God. prior to this, we don't so realize the that half the coup- that- you know, it's like They're trying to kidnap my pants. Democrats. They're finally becoming Democrats, but just only picking up our worst habits. Well, I've been really mad right. by the way that the demonstrators, not the demonstrators, the insurrectionists, the, the rioters, um, were uh, claiming what is left wing, you know, uh, sort of uh, activist left uh, language in order to describe their actions. Yes. Because I felt like, A, if there's one thing Republicans are really good at doing, it's reframing what was a good idea as a bad idea because they've taken it to an extreme to see populism, um, which was a left-wing political movement that now when you mention it, it sounds like far-right fascism because of the way that it's been reframed by the right and by the center, honestly. Um, but I feel like I'm, I'm sort of fearful of the same thing happening to like words like Occupy. They were talking about occupying the Capitol to, you know, to, to sort of ideas like the fact that we own the Capitol. I mean, I say that all the time. I was on the coup cast. I was very like clear that I think we need to be careful about how we discuss the security breaches because there were security breaches, but the security breach, the problematic thing was not that American citizens were able to access public buildings. The problematic thing was that rioters were able to access public buildings where governing was going on. I don't think that we should use this as an impetus to like stop letting people into the Capitol, for example, because those we do own those buildings and those are, are how we make government transparent and accessible. So like, I'm annoyed by the way that they were like commandeering what are good ideas and reframing them as insanity. And that, that actually hampers the work of the far left a lot of the time because it makes it sound like everything the far left is trying to do is actually insane as opposed to fairly reasonable, which a lot of it actually is when you compare it to like, political ideologies abroad. So I, I get, I'm, I'm annoyed at these people for that more like as much as I'm also annoyed at them for just being enormous assholes who also had like the most ridiculous plan that you could have coming into the Capitol and then acted like just, I mean, don't pee in the Capitol. There are bathrooms in there. I mean, like, come don't on. be an asshole. It's like, they're just, if you feel that you own the building, great. Cars. But like, just as you would not pee in your building's lobby just because you are an owner of that building, you would I mean, not pee know. at the Capitol. Maybe these people pee in their houses. We don't know. Yeah, we don't know what they're doing. But you know, one are. thing I will say is that the thing that they really did was prove how enduring our democracy is because all of the members of Congress and Pence, who finally had to break the law and call it the National Guard because the president wouldn't do it. And you know what? I am totally fine with that. Yeah. But like they were traumatized and hiding and had no idea what was going to happen. And then immediately came out and were like, 
fuck it, we're certifying this election. And, you know, it's, we're still I mean, theoretically going to have a tra- peaceful transition of power. It's only January 10th. So much yeah, can happen in 11 don't, days. Yeah. May all be don't good. predict what's going to go but on with the transition. I, I, was, I was really, I was both really impressed by their sort of resilience and the fact that they did that. And I was like, you know, all these people did was prove how strong this democracy actually is. Because there was a six hour coup. And then we were like, all right, we're going to just keep doing what we're doing. And we're going to yeah. keep moving forward. And we're going to keep this process going. And so, you know, I feel like their, their, this attempt and their failure did so much to prove that everything that they were fighting against was absolutely wrong. I think, though, it did create the instability in the air that they were aiming for in a lot of ways. I mean, it does feel very much like, I think a lot of people thought like, okay, I know the Trump movement is sort of difficult to deal with, but like they'll come down eventually. And this kind of action is so much more than just opposition. It's like actually unhinged craziness. It sort of like took a lid off of a kind of movement that actually like the FBI should have been monitoring and carefully making sure that these people were not able to come to DC and were not able to gather in this way. It sort of made it seem like the security apparatus that we rely on to make sure the government doesn't get overthrown was not functional in this case. And especially given the contrast that we saw um, earlier in this year. I think this is why there have been a lot of articles about like, black people aren't surprised by this because I have never once had any kind of thoughts. Like, of course this happened. Of course they let it happen. But that's, I like I think- Like, I never expected this Trump movement to calm down. These people have like, none of this was shocking or surprising at all. And I'm just like, no, but I think quickly, (laughs) I think that the, um, the difference is like, I think that in left wing circles, we were always talking about this being a possibility. And we always knew that this could end this way. And I think that there was not that conversation happening in the center. Like, I think that it brought the conversation to the Hmm. sort of the center where people, I think, had not been clear on identifying that these were real risks of um, having this kind of, uh, yeah. this, this sort of unchecked movement in the air. Like it, it, I mean, in terms of like broad political conversation, this really wasn't getting discussed by moderate Democrats as a real possibility. They were still in their, we should unify phase. They elected Joe Biden who doesn't believe in prosecuting Trump. They have well, Jim Clyburn thinking we shouldn't even, impeach, you know. Oh right. God. So they're still there. This didn't change yeah. them. One no, but bit. I think that it edged no. the conversation further into their field because there are definitely people on in the center who are very concerned about this, who have signed on to the articles of impeachment, who would not have been that outspoken. I mean, Clyburn, I don't know what to say about Clyburn. I have a lot to say about him, but also nothing because I'm mad. And I just don't, um, I, I think that it makes more political sense to do this like literally now. In a right hundred days, you know, all he's doing is pushing this off so they don't actually have to do it. I and also, it, in a hundred days, Trump, nobody wants to do. It makes Trump relevant for a hundred days. Well, that's true, but also like, like get him out. And this is the, the thing, thing that I have. Make this, is the th- yeah. this is the thing that I have been trying to convey to people, and I think there was some polling this week that showed that I was right about it. But like, I think people are so, in terms of impeachment, I think people still are thinking about the last impeachment, and there were a lot of. Uh, now, I disagreed with this because I felt like we should have just blasted him out of a cannon at the earliest convenience that we had. Uh, but like, there were, you know, thinking and well-meaning people who were making reasonable points about the potential for political blowback to that previous impeachment. Like I said, right. uh, we disagreed with them. You and I, Lila did. But there is not. There's no political blowback on this. No. Like, I, I think something like pushing, uh, like over almost two thirds of people like want impeachment, like something like 75% of people like blame him for the insurrection. I, these might not be exact numbers, but like, I mean, over overwhelmingly, the entirety of the country, including many Republicans are ready to just like, wash our hands of him and are fine with doing impeachment like they are not democrats are not going to be held accountable elect uh, you know at the ballot box two years from now for doing impeachment literally on monday like uh, i also i think that one of the things that i am starting to see kind of like a, i've been just seeing quotes about this in like interspersed in various articles like in and around coup related conversations are Republicans noting that a lot of their other, a lot of the other Republicans, the ones who supported 
you know, the stopping of the, you know, the not counting of the votes, the ones who were helping give their 70 person strong speeches in the house. A lot of them knew that what they were doing was not based on factual information, knew, you know, they all knew what they were doing, but that part of their logic in going along with it had to do with their and their family's personal safety because their own supporters have gotten so out of control that they are like afraid for their own safety, which listen, they all brought that on themselves. So I'm not here to suggest right. that they should make yeah, immoral choices on that basis because that's not the case. But I also know that the Republican party is defined by its lack of empathy. So they are self-interested people. I mean, everyone in politics is, but especially the Republican party at their sort of most essential core. And it worries me the perception that they, that they are able to kind of like justify their terrible actions um, based on a perception. I mean, I think that's, that's why I'm concerned about the way that, you know, the, the sort of information coming out about this like ragtag ridiculous storming of the Capitol is because I think it gives them the sort of, um, it, it creates an impetus for them to act in selfish ways that are harming the country because they actually do probably rightfully fear for their personal safety from these loons. I mean, Lindsay, look at what happened to Lindsey Graham trying to fly home the other day. <laughs> and like, okay. did he deserve that? Certainly. But <laughs> I mean, if I am like just some rando Trump Republican from like rando America, and I am worried that my like wife and child are sitting at home by themselves in our rando county in rando America, like I'm worried that that prevents them from having, because they're, they're not brave people. We know that. <laughs> I'm worried that that, you know, that there is political blowback for some of them in a way that is not reflective of what their political responsibilities are or what their responsibilities as just like someone who's supposed to uphold the constitution are but because of the way that they justify all their policy, which is always selfish, it gives them sort of a, a reason to not accept reality. Well, we don't yeah, need- Yeah, but here's the thing. Oh. Security is a thing. The Secret Service is a thing. And right. if they're credible vets, they can get protection. So I feel like that's just another excuse. Yeah. I, well, and also they're making it up too, because Josh Hawley was trying to make it seem like his whole family was in danger and we right. saw the tape and the, nobody's, n nobody there was in danger of anything. So like they're also- yeah some of that is just bullshit that they are making up as cover for themselves. I want to be clear though, that the one political ideology that defines conservatism in every case is fear. They are fearful people. Why? They are That's afraid of everything. Yes. Yes. This is, yes. this is not to expect that they will have a rational response to this. I mean, also what happened to even them in the Capitol was incredibly traumatic when you sort of piece together the stories from the members of Congress that were involved you know, like I think uh, Rebecca Tracer interviewed uh, Pramila Jayapal about, you know, the, the evacuation that she was a part of. And like, it sounded incredibly traumatic. Like, I don't expect, these are the people that kind of, these are the people that don't see reality for what it is already. These are already like incredibly fearful people. Yes. And yeah. so like, I don't trust them to like be reasonable. And I also don't trust that us telling them that they shouldn't be fearful is actually sufficient to get them to act you know, to sort of see reality for what it is, because it's never worked at any time in the past. <laughs> Actually, you know, there is the, the thing that helped me finally understand how much people and particularly Republicans are governed by fear uh, is this article I read years ago about this family where uh, it's one of the families where like, you know, a four year old had shot and killed a two year old, right? And so the this reporter was interviewing the parents and the grandparents and et cetera. And all of them still had guns all over the house in the glove compartment at the car, everywhere else. And the reporter said, well, I, I understand why do you still have guns absolutely everywhere? And they said, well, but what if someone tries to like rob us or something? And the reporter said, well, has anyone ever robbed you? Or <laughs> well, no, but they could, you know? And it's like that, that mentality that our, child killed our child because a gun was lying around the house but we still have them everywhere just in case something happens that is such fear that divorces you from reality yeah that i think for me you know it it helped me understand because i just don't live in that well i i should be more afraid of things but i was like i'm just gonna jump off this cliff it's probably fine you know and so <laughs> like i and i could not understand it at all and that helped me get it and i think that and understanding how that kind of fear has been stoked and driven for decades by, you know, Fox News. I mean, all of this really started with the teabaggers. 
Mm-hmm. Is what I will always call them. You know, mm-hmm. like it's just they really are yeah. living in such a parallel universe mm-hmm. that is completely one hundred percent driven by fear, and in which they've been living all of their media, all of their yeah. their friends, their relations, their reality, etc., for so long that they are no longer people who can be reasoned with. I mean, that's that people. describes perfectly the mentality of the kind of people that would storm the Capitol to quote exactly. unquote save yes. the democracy. Exactly. Totally. Those exactly. are scared people. I, they're, yeah, they're insane. <laughs> but but that was. But they've I mean, also and, been driven insane because the people who are scaring right. them also are doing it for money. Like they need you yeah. to be really scared, so you buy these like bunkers and these prepper totally. kits and this gold and whatever. And but there has been no logic, and you know, there's no spreadsheets. So, like Sean had yeah. some, you know. No, and they're also doing it. Yes, and they're in terms of you know, like let's say Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz, like those guys. You know, I mean, as much as I dislike both of them, neither of them are stupid. I, Josh Hawley went to Yale, you know what I mean? Like Josh Hawley knows that there was not election fraud and he knew even as he was giving a speech on the floor that the election wasn't going to be overturned. Like he, not, like, so all of these people are are using that fear yeah. and stupidity and you know, what, whatever else to their own, for their own personal benefits. And the fact that the people themselves can't see that that's what's happening, it's, I, you know, it's sad. Well, you really. don't know what you don't know. No. You know, if your yeah. media environment is entirely lies, then well, you don't true. know that. Yeah. And I think that is why it's- Right, but important. they know that they're lying to them, I guess. Right, I think it's important yeah. that we hold some of yeah. the people who drove this to this point responsible because, you know, I Absolutely. think it's not just enough to say that people should know not to burst into the Capitol and try to kidnap the vice president. <laughs> now, should they? <laughs> Maybe yes, but that's not- in, that's not the entire story here. There's an additional part of the story where people were knowingly propagating lies like the president, like Josh Hawley, like Ted Cruz. And those people have like a really direct hand in the violence that occurred, even though they were also victims of it in certain cases. I mean, certainly Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz had to evacuate with everyone else. But the fact that even after that, they didn't back down, the fact that they had been lying so much up until this point to the extent that they created people who were, who who legitimately thought that the that their democracy had been taken from them i mean that yeah. is that's something that lies directly at the feet of basically the whole republican party because yeah. well and not just the party i mean look at like journalists this. right like after the coup megan kelly was still like super pro trump on twitter yeah right and so and, and this is too where and this is why everybody was angry with nbc because it's like you let they we've let these people so infect just totally. our, our normal media that isn't so extreme and far right wing that it, it brings more people in and they really need to be held accountable too. Totally. Fox yes, really, absolutely. I mean, they won't be, but they should be held accountable. This, they yep. did this. Yep. That's, Great. yeah, I think that's kind of a, it, I think that's in part why we have to really like act in, in have, have these people face political consequences. We have to, Trump cannot just be like someone that in a hundred days we're like, oh, I guess blah, blah, blah. Yeah. There, we, we have to send a message. We need to send a message to Holly and Ted Cruz because they also knowingly incited a, an insurrection. Like, and I think up until the point where we can agree that everyone who was responsible for this has been in some way held responsible for it, we should be calling it a coup and an insurrection because <laughs> right, sure, that yeah. is what they were trying to, you know, that that is what they were right. calling for. That's what, and that's what they incited. I mean, just because their so. followers weren't organized yeah. is, you know, that's been the story of Trump this whole time. He's yeah. a fascist who's not very smart. A smart fascist, you know, Tom yeah. Cotton wouldn't be, totally. is, is a smart fascist, so don't let him be the president, but like he's, he's the next step if we become comfortable with incompetent fascism. Yeah. Um, there need to be consequences before we get to the Tom Cotton stage. Of the... Right. Yeah. In any case, let's talk briefly about, before we move on to other topics, the, the Senate is now going to be Democratic controlled. Um, and Brent had some thoughts on that. I had some thoughts on that. Um, and we should talk about that before we get too carried away. Yeah, well, I just, you know, it's like, it seems like every time the Senate is close or anything like that, it's like, it's the insane moderates who are basically Republicans that end up getting all of the power. That's who stripped anything good out of the ACA back in the ben day. Like, Nelson, that's who, that you know, but fucker. It, like, it's the Democrats who constantly sort of like ruin anything good when they have the ability to actually not do so. And it's going to be people like Joe Manchin and some others, but I'm specifically, I'm just going to use Joe Manchin as a well, proxy for one. like all of he's these people. The but because it's actually 50-50, 
Bernie Sanders has the exact same amount of power as Joe Manchin does right now, right? Like if Bernie Sanders doesn't like something, then- He can also not vote for it. Then he can also not vote for it. And I, I like, and I'm not saying that like, I hope the Democrats just keep, you know, holding up their own, you know, votes and can't get out of their own way and can't pass anything because that's something that we would also probably notably do. Um, but like, I, I just want to like, I, I just want, and I'm sure Bernie knows this because he's not an idiot, but like, I just want like, you know, I just want to reframe that, this idea that now like the most extreme moderate is the person who gets to pick and choose what we get to do in the Senate because fuck that. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Well, it'll be framed that way. And because of that, there will be political pressure to compromise on Democrats because people who don't understand the process very well will put pressure on their representatives totally. to, to get stuff done. Yep. And we should just be clear that Bernie Sanders has equivalent bargaining power to Joe Manchin. And also Bernie Sanders has some issues that are bipartisan issues that are not really, that are sort of untethered from the Democratic establishment. And some of those things are things that we could actually see him get done in a situation like this, where, you know, he was working with Mike Lee on ending the war in Yemen. Bernie sort of notably tends to find these like weird, you know, these small issues where he can find one Republican to work. I mean, he was working with Josh Hawley to get $2,000 checks to everyone. Like he's somebody who often will find a Republican co-sponsor on an issue that's fairly popular, but not with the Republican majority. So I think we should also be putting some pressure on the Democratic leadership to make sure that bills like that, that were being held up by Mitch McConnell, but have bipartisan support, get to a vote, even though Bernie Sanders is the person that proposed them. Yeah. Because some, like, we should also end the war in, we should stop <laughs> funding the war in Yemen. Like, sure. you know, these, some of these are things that are popular with voters and also good ideas. And the Republican leadership, even though they were being co you know, they were being introduced with Republican sponsors, um, yeah. the Republican leadership wasn't going to bring them to a vote. But there's also a chance the Democratic leadership won't because they don't like it when the far left looks like they've done something. So I we know. need to make sure that like that kind of policy doesn't hamper good ideas from happening as well, just because they came out of the Bernie Sanders, you know, sort of like world. Well, um, thankfully, that's something we do too. Thankfully, the Biden platform itself, in many ways, is actually fairly decent. Could it be better? Yes, of course. But I mean, like. If he's going to try and get some of the things that he has already put out through right now, you would think that he would have 50 votes for that. And that's where if like if Joe Manchin is going to be the one who's going to hold something up that we like is a plan that Biden had introduced that we all sort of like felt like was a good idea anyway, then that's where he can definitely like go fuck off. And the one thing I will say that made me feel pretty good is that I don't necessarily always feel like Biden like takes a note very well necessarily. And I don't really love Merrick Garland necessarily as a choice for AG, but he announced it literally on Wednesday morning. And the holdup, because people have been, the reason that he hadn't named his AG yet is because I think he wanted it to be Merrick Garland, but he was afraid that he wasn't gonna be able to get Merrick Garland's replacement through the Senate because he sits on the DC circuit court. And so it was like, hours after those Georgia races had been called that he nominated Merrick Garland. So like, clearly he was like, all right, I'm going to be able to push shit through the Senate. So like, I'm, my hope is that like January 21st, it's like a deluge of, I know they've already said that they're going to do $2,000 before they do anything else. Like that's ready to go. Like there's so many things that are just ready to go that in a 50, 50 yeah, Senate, moderate shit right like he's gonna be able to push through merrick garland well, Yay. oh my god I know. i'm so excited a guy who's shit on civil liberties it's an a no i agree i agree with you that but like i mean that's the thing that's this none of this is exciting people kept texting me oh congratulations on georgia i'm like yay more moderates in charge i've seen this before <sighs> i was alive in 2010 sure. you know biden's not gonna do anything exciting or adventurous that actually could get people interested it's all just gonna be a bunch of moderate shit that doesn't actually make a difference that just takes us back to the status quo and that gets middle class white people just comfortable enough that they can forget like that the they last four years completely uh none of this is exciting or interesting at all it's just i mean we've seen biden i mean first of all i know i think we talked about his cabinet picks they're all terrible and they're all moderate he's yeah. not going to do any of the things that we actually need to do to move this country forward yeah. so sure we've got 50 votes we could have 
a hundred percent of the House and Senate, and Democrats would still never actually push forward any real progressive change. I agree with that, and I'm not saying that he's going to push forward progressive change. But I guess, I guess, maybe to just clarify a little bit more is that he's not going to have to go in equivocating. Do you know right. what I mean? Like, his platform uh, like, is so his whole campaign was an equivocation. I, I know. I and know. look at the ACA. We had all the votes for the ACA, and then totally. Pelosi kept hoping maybe someone, maybe a Republican, will vote for us if we if we get rid of this. And then they didn't. She said, "Well, what if we get rid of this?" They never voted with us, but we no. ended up like cutting off our own legs. Yeah, and no, that's, I think that, that when... Biden's whole platform was, "You guys, I was friends with McCain." <laughs> right. We have to be really careful that he doesn't do what he is going to want to do. And I think this is where Bernie Sanders having this kind of leverage inside of the caucus is helpful. Is you know. Joe Biden's, to use healthcare as an example, you know, his plan to expand Medicaid to people 60 and over is like the most minimal thing that you could do if you, you know, like on earth. If he goes in and is like, we're willing to compromise off 60 when, you know, Hillary Clinton was calling for 55. I mean, like, this is not even a real win for anyone. If he goes in equivocating on 60, then we like actually shouldn't bother doing anything. But I think- And might I add, Hillary Clinton- was willing to go to 55 when we were not in a global pandemic. Right, just well, right, yeah. on, a, on a Wednesday. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, but I think I'm it would be starting... helpful to have like the sort of left have the leverage that the center has for things like that, where they can be like, no, this was the compromise. We're not uh, going further. Like Bernie Sanders does not need to vote to lower it to 64. No, and they also have the, they have the same, I, we're talking about the Senate because we were just talking about the Senate raises and now it's 50-50, but like they have really even more leverage in the House, especially considering the narrow minority, which is sad that it's a narrow minority. But I mean, like <laughs> that narrow minority now gives the left the progressive even caucus. more power because they can actually kill something if they want to. Yeah. Well, and the progressive caucus reorganized this year so that they would be able to, because it used to be that they were not really progressives. So right, that, like every that's... single Democrat in the House was in the pro progressive yeah. caucus. But trendy right now. Isn't it fun to be trendy? I had never been this trendy before because of- You're super trendy right now. I mean, you're I... out here snowshoeing. I'm snowshoeing, I know. It's you're everything I do is- <laughs> Everything you do it. is on the New York Times the next day. I know. <laughs> it's, it's like I'm determining what's fashionable. Should we talk about <laughs> Merrick Garland? Well, let's, before we move on to Merrick Garland, because there's some like other coup stuff that's funny. Oh, yeah, that's right. Let's, let's tell you the, end. we'll, we no, want no, we'll do that at the end. It. Let's, we'll do it at the end. I'm going to, yeah, well, let's end with the funny coup stuff so that we can get through, because I think it is right to keep talking about the cabinet picks and yeah, the Yeah, we've skipped around right a little now. bit. Um, but uh, before we move on from that, from the Senate specifically, I think we should also note that the real question and conversation here is about filibuster reform. It's about whether Joe Manchin would support filibuster reform. Um, and he has not been interested in doing that in the past. I don't know why he wouldn't because it would give him like the ability to kill legislation personally, which is like what everyone dreams of. But in any case, that's related somewhere to put to, to sort of keep your eye on the ball. And then also as final Senate news that is related to the coup, um, you know, there's an, the articles of impeachment have 190 co-sponsors in the House as of now, but two Republican senators have called for Trump's resignation. Two. There they, was a coup and I only know. two Republican and senators. And both of them are people that like, Lisa Murkowski doesn't need anyone because she right. can get, she can win on a write-in vote and <laughs> Pat Toomey's going to retire. So I like, you know, I don't know what it, to say about any of them, but um, I do think that they are not going to be able to get away with having no repercussions for Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley because their hometown papers are pissed. Like it's well, Hawley lost a book deal, so that's and Hawley lost his book deal, which he believes is a First Amendment issue, as if they haven't been supporting what? private companies being able to discriminate against people this whole time. But whatever, I know, so um, good. It's like such a Those gay wedding cakes medicine. coming back to bite them. All of it, um, but <laughs> I I think that there is maybe some. I mean, look, what. I don't know what to do about Holly. He's just like an asshole. Ted Cruz is the most hated person in the Congress by other people in Congress. Nobody likes him. Republicans oh, yeah. don't like him. Democrats don't like him. He's like a personally unpleasant person. Well, if you spend time like on the himself. Hill, you hear people just like <laughs> shit talking him randomly without you asking. Like, I think the, um, the, the sort of, the outlook for Ted Cruz has got to be pretty bad just in terms of his ability to ever be effective at his job ever again because everyone already hated him so much. And now they can just be like, oh, and also you're a traitor. 
like like a direct traitor. Yeah. Like you're You know, I have a not- thought because it's very clear that Ted Cruz really does actually deeply hate himself. It should be mandatory that every single member of Congress have weekly therapy. I honestly think that if these people had therapy that they I know. like the country would be different because so many of these people are just dealing with all of this trauma they are in a like bad place self-hatred and not being in reality and they just need somebody to sit down and help them work that shit out before they write a law I mean everybody knows how I feel about weekly therapy yeah <laughs> so, I just got I think- talk space and it's like daily therapy it's really weird we just like text all the time oh interesting Crazy. I sound I stressful know, it's, it's- <laughs> I can't, I don't know, I don't know how I feel about it yet. I'm keeping like- I wouldn't want to have to be in touch with my feelings every day. (laughs) I feel like once a week is plenty. I mean, my goal is to eventually channel my inner LeVar Burton and be the most even keeled and kind person on earth. And so I I, I feel like I might need daily therapy to get there. (laughs) I guess my goals are not quite as aspirational. (laughs) You don't want to be LeVar Burton. <laughs> well, I just don't believe in my ability to be LeVar, LeVar Burton. So as fun as it would be, I just like don't, I don't see how I could ever I get there. Yeah. Be tough. Oh, man. But I do, I mean, I do think that, that, I mean, just when we're, you know, when we're thinking even about the fact that we've got 40 or however freaking many Republican senators who are like, eh, that was a coup. But I mean, I'm still not going to like say anything bad about Trump. Like we really need to think deeper about what the hell's going on here. Yeah. Because this is yeah. not a problem that's going to be solved in 11 days. No. no. Certainly not. No. And, no. and I think also we need, we need to see some action in part to let people believe that action is possible so that people like this are not allowed to continue telling us that no action can happen. I think one of the innovations of the McConnell era is the idea that we can't expect anything to happen, so we shouldn't ask. Um, and I, that's kind of what I like actually about having some of these new members of Congress. Like this is why Cory Bush is like my new favorite person oh. in America for, I mean, Bush. for any reason that you like, obviously she is great for all the reasons, but specifically, I think she's someone that came in and she is not from the sort of elected political space. She is from the activist space. And one thing I always say about something that's nice about working in the activist space, as opposed to the political space is, Activists are about proposing what should be possible, not about working within the system to figure out what is possible under the current rules. And so when she comes in, she is able to bring a perspective of, as someone who is used to challenging the rules as opposed to just challenging the outcomes that are possible. And I think that in this moment, we need people like that to be really outspoken, which obviously, thankfully, she is. But there are other people in Congress who should, you know, who are doing this work, who can be doing this work as well, um, because we need to sort of challenge our conceptions of what is actually possible by by insisting that things that someone like Mitch McConnell would tell us aren't actually are if we decide they are. Like, I think, you know, we need to sort of change our expectations a little bit around what we should be asking of these people in the first place. Um, Cori Bush is leading us yeah. in that charge. Yeah. Like the hero she is. Lucky to have her. So true. Okay. <clears throat> Cabinet picks. Cabinet picks. Let me tell you why we keep putting off actually diving in. It's because there's nothing to say about Merrick Garland as attorney general. It's like, well, there was a, an NBC headline that I think put it best, which was Biden making Merrick Garland attorney general isn't the best idea. It also isn't the worst one. That's the whole headline. There you go. It's you like, I couldn't They're feel more wrong. yawny about it. Would well, I, I mean, when like we, someone better? Yeah. When we, when we think back to why he was chosen as the Supreme Court nominee at the time that he was chosen, it was because he was the nominee that Obama thought a Republican Senate would actually approve because at that time yep. the yeah. the um, the Senate was held by the Republicans, and that was a very specific choice for Merrick Garland um, be- because of that because they felt like he was probably like just to the right enough that like maybe there would be a couple Republicans that might tolerate it. Um, so like I don't know why we're supposed to be getting it like people I think because of how that whole situation went down have this very like. Merrick Garland, just like his name has become sort of like hero status, but nobody really knows why. Um, just yeah. because people felt like he got done dirty and he did, I suppose, but like uh, that doesn't make him any better than he is. Yeah. Uh, you want to really bum yourself out? Imagine who Julian Castro would have put on his cabinet. I know. Mm. 
I know. I, it's, I, sad, I think of that. I, I have like various people, like I have like a whole list of people whose cabinets I have like imagined <laughs> and like all of them are better than Joe Biden, obviously, aside from Pete Buttigieg, who is the person that I hate most in the world. But who um, is on Biden's cabinet? I know, but so that's what I was going to say. He's, he's in he's the cabinet that Biden is picking. So I, it's like <laughs> things are as bad as they can get. I oh, think God. I wish that they had chosen like a civil rights lawyer type well, like, well sally yates like, would have been great sally yates would have been great i was okay with doug jones well, I even doug jones has a history of i mean oh my god can you imagine sherilyn cases. eifel as ag oh my god that would be amazing. the world would change i and yeah. that's who i would have chosen i mean yeah. come on there were real this is the problem we have when we're at a point when we have all the imagination and opportunity in the world and could choose anyone and you know now it's going to get passed because you control congress like he once he knew that we had control of Congress and could pass absolutely anyone, he said, "Great, Merrick Garland." Merrick Garland, <laughs> really? Yeah. Merrick Garland. That's the guy that I want. That I have the most imagination and hope for the future. Yeah. Like, like also, when I think of anyone I could choose, it's that dude. Well, it's like, clear so that's who he wanted. You know what I mean? It's, like it's he's who that, he wanted. Like, yes, it's who he wanted. wanted. Right. Yeah. And I think that I, you know, when you think about like, like I would have preferred even Doug Jones you know, for, you know, for reasons of his background in as a civil rights attorney, but also just because I think that he even would have been more sort of like um, instrumental in actively pursuing, you know, more effective civil rights uh, policy in, in the right. Justice Department. Um, and he's like a former conservative Democrat senator. He could have passed. Right. And right. He's, he's also pretty he doesn't moderate. have a job right now. <laughs> and he's available. Yeah, he's also <laughs> like, I don't know what, like, if you're going to just pick some like rando moderate white guy, like pick Doug Jones. Yep. Don't even, yeah. Merrick Garland isn't even on the high list of generic moderate white guys. I agree. In any case. More generic really moderate white guys. About it. Well, maybe not, maybe yeah, less yeah. moderate, but. Um, generic, certainly. Yeah. Uh, Labor secretary, which was the one that the left was, is always holding out for and never and gets. Did not get. <laughs> yeah, it's, I was hoping that the last couple, we would like finally get a vote right, be like, thrown to us oh. because like, I think a lot of people had been sort of being like, oh, well, he's just like, he's picking nominees that like he thinks can get through depending on like what happens in Georgia. So it's sort of like, where is the, you know, like Bernie Sanders-esque labor secretary here, who he mentioned specifically by name that the two of them had talked and thought it was a good idea that like maybe just like Bernie stay in the, stay in the Senate because like there would be a special Senate election in Vermont, like Vermont, like might elect yeah. a, I mean, yeah. I guess I have a Republican That's governor, but idea. I mean, so that was completely ridiculous, but there's people in his sphere that would have obviously been great labor secretaries. Yeah, um, Wait, Bernie Sarah, Sanders is not um, the only Bernie Sanders. No, yeah, right, exactly, <laughs> yeah. So, and this is often like, a position that will get a progressive in it and people will tolerate having a progressive in even Republicans if they're having to pass it just sort of like all right well labor it's going to be a you know it's going to be a labor union guy it's going to be somebody who's probably you know maybe further to the left than than others so it's like this is your one opportunity to literally just be like all right well we're going to give you know labor to a progressive and just like maybe they'll be happy with their lives for once right. but instead they gave it to Marty <laughs> Walsh who's the mayor of Boston who's like look a union guy. Right. So great. Not special. Not a special union guy. <laughs> not no. and not, a Boston union guy. A which Boston union guy, which is, is a different worrisome. animal. The only exciting thing about this is that it opens up the Boston mayoral race because he was yes. gonna run again. He was gonna and, run. And you know, there are so many great municipal elections this year. And when we're looking at progressive bench building. Yep. You're seeing across the country in every different type of state, really incredible progressive mayors getting elected. Yep. And so this gives me some hope that maybe Boston, which is the least progressive city of all time, maybe Boston can get a really progressive mayor. There's some really great candidates, including a, a woman who's an activist and is really awesome. And like, maybe the, these are the steps, maybe, maybe Biden is playing third dimensional chess <laughs> and what he's doing <laughs> It's clearing out Building a bunch the bench of offices for so that we can yeah. build that bench, and forty years from now, we can have a really progressive yeah. secretary. Yeah, isn't there at least one? Because isn't there at least one woman of color running in that race, or thinking about running in that race? Yeah, yeah, also? That's, like, that's is that who you were talking about? Okay, remember. 
Yeah. Yes, and I can't remember her name, um, but there was a really exciting woman there who um, I don't know, maybe will endorse. But I'm yeah. So that's that's the only good thing about this is that it gets him out of being mayor of Boston, and they can hopefully get someone new and exciting in there. Also, yeah. Put term limits in Boston. What is your problem? <laughs> no, right. Everybody the loves term, term limits in the whole world. Boston. The world wants term limits. Yeah. Americans yeah. want term limits. Non-Americans want term limits. We all do. It's a mm -hmm. universal condition. Um, <laughs> Well, if Biden is playing three-dimensional chess, then maybe that explains why Gina Raimondo was chosen for commerce. I. The more we hear about her, the worse. This is what are. I chose to get mad about post coup this week. Lila can attest. Yeah, I Brent literally was sending me like a series of crazy unhinged text messages. Unhinged about text, and then I texted our other like text thread with uh, Grant, who is, has been fairly active this week. You know, he's been on the podcast a few times, uh, and I was just sort of like, I need somebody to get mad with me about this <laughs> because like I was so mad. I just can't even, I can't even describe how much I dislike Gina Raimondo. And I thought that we had made it clear enough both to Biden and to her that we didn't want her because she literally, they floated her name for um, HHS, HHS and all of planet earth was like, no, thank you, ma'am. And she withdrew her own name from consideration for HHS. So I thought we had covered not wanting Gina Raimondo in the cabinet, but apparently, no, we have not. No, she's she just needed a different job. I don't thinking? even know what commerce does other than oversee the census, which she made no comment about, which is easily going to be the most pressing thing that she's gonna have to deal with when she gets in there. Neither her or the deputy uh, commerce secretary nominee mentioned it in their speeches or in their public statements that they released. So like, first off, they just don't even seem to know what they're gonna have to be doing once they get there, because that's gonna be the first shit show mess like in that department that anybody's gonna have to, to deal with. But like, she is a Republican. And I know that we sort of like say that whenever we get mad at a moderate, but like, she actually could be like, I don't understand how she's not the, no, the Rhode Island don't. Democratic Party is schizophrenic and insane. There are really conservative members of that party yep. that are serving under the same party mantle as really, you know, that really progressive slate of people that got elected in the last um, local elections there. Like the Rhode Island Democratic Party, because it is not politically tenable to be a Republican in Rhode Island, spans the entire political spectrum, basically. I mean, if yep. I had to summarize what's going on. So mm -hmm. she basically is a Rhode Island Republican. She's yeah. part of the wing of the Democratic Party there that's really conservative. But like not only, ha I mean, part of the reason why we got rid of her for HHS was because she had, uh, I mean, Biden doesn't so much care that she's like very against Medicare for all because like that's to be expected. So but indeed. she also has like okay. cut uh, tens of millions of dollars out of the state's Medicaid fund. She also like rerouted like some of that money directly to insurance companies. She like approved um, like just recently, I think it was like in August, um, a huge uh, increase in premiums uh, for um, that other Democrats in the state were like, A, this is unnecessary, and B, why are you doing this? We're in a fucking pandemic. Um, yeah. And also, up until the pandemic hit, which is the time that a lot of governors' approval ratings went up to a degree just because they were sort of seen as the only people who were like properly, you know, managing this while the federal, federal government was failing epically, she had the worst approval rating of all 50 governors, Gina Raimondo. So like nobody's more excited than the people of Rhode Island to have her in the Biden cabinet because it means they don't have to deal with her any longer. Well, I mean, that state had one of the, the worst COVID outbreaks, certainly in the region, like certainly in New England, mid-Atlantic states and among the worst in the nation. Well, and that's why people, when they were like, talking about her for HHS was like, um, we're in the middle of a pandemic and she just bungled the shit out of this. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. But like also, you know, she cut public pensions by quite a bit in the state. She's not even good on on choice. Like she got downgraded by um, NARAL to a mixed choice because she like demanded that health insurance companies like list options on their state exchange that like did not cover abortion, even though that they're supposed to. Like she's bad on literally everything. everything. What? Bad on everything. I'm yes. sorry. Yes. What? Yes. She's terrible. Nobody does that. Who do Nobody does that. You don't that. need to. Nobody would need to do that. It's like what? an unnecessary what? shot what? Yeah. The, at bad Seriously, idea making. What is wrong with Joe Biden? I know. Oh, also, in, also in April, 
she um, she issued an executive order uh, that shielded nursing homes from lawsuits with their um, business decisions about you know injuring or killing people, like in regards to the COVID outbreak. She's literally with Mitch McConnell on shielding businesses from liability. You know what? From this liability. is all Obama's fault. And I need to have a long talk with Barack Obama because this is all because of him and his <laughs> undemocratic actions during the primary. And now this is what we have to deal with. Obama, just like stay on your yacht and <laughs> off I the phone. would pay every cent that I have to just be a witness to Kat's conversation with Barack Obama. <laughs> all I need is 15 minutes. <laughs> oh, I believe it. I, well, 15 um, minutes if he doesn't talk. Oh, oh, he's not talking. Yeah. Was, he, let's not... No. I need more than 15 minutes if he wants to answer. <laughs> he doesn't have an answer. There's no, no excuse. His excuse is I'm a moderate who believes in institutions. I don't fucking care. Go <laughs> away. This is all because of him. This is all his fault. Thanks, I'm so Obama. angry. Like, anyway. Who requires insurers to have plans that don't cover abortion? That no one ever thought of that before. No, she like came up with like uniquely bad ideas that she then unnecessarily... I mean, that's like raising premiums in a pandemic. No one needs to do that. That's a not, no that's not a thing that needs to be done. In California, you? they lowered premiums because they were like, no one's been able to access any health care. So you can't charge the same amount as you would normally charge. And meanwhile, in Rhode Island, a democratic state, quote unquote. Um, and this is, I think, maybe also a reason to think about, you know, Rhode Island is a democratic state but it has a history of having the Chafee family be in charge of everything because they basically have like a monarchy of like out of touch aristocrats that was for a long time, just like in charge of everything there. And so like, they're also getting their sea legs in the post monarchy era in Rhode Island and they're not doing it right. <laughs> no. She's also um, a charter school advocate, by the way. Of course she is. Well, she would have to be. I mean, that well, just makes- That is the least shocking thing on this list. Right? <laughs> I know. That's yeah. just good common sense. The Bloomberg supporter. Well, of course, well, obviously. Uh, again, all the mayors. Not shocked at all. Uh -huh. I mean, all, probably, the, all those mayors and governors. Probably because uh, she's also a venture capitalist herself. She comes from Wall Street. I understand. So anyway. Maybe um, she's someone whose excessive wealth we can secretly tax, put that money back into circulation oh, like and she won't know it's gone. Yeah. You know what? Now that I know that you can do a coup and not face any consequences, I would like to do a coup about this. <laughs> <laughs> right. January 21st, Cat's coup is going to come to Washington. <laughs> For real. <laughs> I'm going to interrupt the confirmation of Rainbow. It will just be, she'll just be in there angry about the Commerce Department. No one even knows what the Commerce Department <laughs> is. I know. Like, I, you, can, can citizens filibuster? Can I pull a Mr. Smith that goes to Washington? Ooh, a citizen filibuster. Ooh, I a like citizen it. filibuster. You know, I feel like I would be uniquely gifted at a citizen filibuster if yeah, one yeah. was allowed because I have spent up to five hours filibustering flights that I've been on with people. If I, if I happen to sit next to a chatty person on a flight and I try to be careful about reading the signs because I know people hate talking to strangers on planes, but there are sometimes people who love it like myself. And when I happen to be seated next to one of them, I can talk for the full five hours. I, I don't need any breaks. I don't need to eat or use the bathroom. Yeah, like I, I can bathroom. just get in there and talk. <clears throat> so I feel like I, this might be like a calling of mine that I've never uh, really been able to explore. I mean, and the thing is that people can hire you out. Like I could hire you and say, Lila, I need you right. to go uh, yeah. oh, filibuster so the Raimondo confirmation. And then you have eight and a half hours to talk about why the yeah. metric system sucks. No, exactly. I mean, it's I have so many thoughts time. on things <laughs> that no one so is listening good. to. Honestly, but... this is A, how you become a millionaire and it's how we make America better. That's right. That's right. Yep. All right, let's hire get on filibuster. it. Oh man. In any like case, that. um. Speaking of HHS and therefore speaking yeah. of national health policy, we also want to, we, we would be remiss. We don't have. We didn't discuss the uh, rollout of the vaccines being a complete disaster and no one knowing if we'll ever, ever be able to get vaccinated. Yeah, I mean, just a quick timeline anyway. Back in October, HHS Secretary Alex Azar said that there were going to be 100 million doses of uh, vaccine by the available by the end of the year. And then like two That's weeks later- with an imagination. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. And then two weeks later, he was like, wait, it's actually going to be 40 million. And then in December, he was like, actually, it's going to be 20 million. And then now by at the end of the month, like 3 million vaccines have been in arms. So like that is just sort of like, that's that's been just the, the overall story of the rollout. Well, um, and I, I just read a story that said that only 150,000 have gotten both doses. Oh. 
Well, and that is actually, well, and that's actually a thing that Biden said this week is that they are going to now just get as many first doses into, like, they're basically just going to release all the doses because they had been holding doses back for second doses. But like, you get some, as bad as it is right now, you do get some immunity from the first dose, supposedly. So it's like, get as many, I mean, shit, we're going to get to herd immunity with all of us just getting it naturally before all of these vaccines get out. So like you this need was to get a that as many people as possible. Like from the beginning, uh, because I feel like everyone is acting in a typical American approach to this problem. Everyone is desperately trying to figure out who deserves these the most. And this is like <laughs> a crisis where we just need as many people as possible to have them. We're already having issues with regular people agreeing to get them. So yeah. Instead of obsessively seeking out the most deserving patients, we should A, it would be nice if we had a coordinated plan because we could make sure that the people who actually deserve them the most, for example, the Latino population of LA, which has three times the rate of COVID of any other group of people in LA are getting special attention. But in the absence of any plans, what they should be doing is giving them to like literally anyone who will show up and get one they as should quickly be knocking as possible. On every door in LA County. Yes. Everyone in LA has COVID. How has no one knocked on my door yet and been like, stick out your arm, you're getting a shot? Right. I mean, I like know. they should literally just be with whatever they have, giving as much minor protection to as many people as possible to stop the community spread. Because you know what really puts doctors' lives in danger is yes. people coming in with COVID to their doc to their office. So like yeah. we're putting people in the gift shops of hospitals right now. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and that's what, you know, I think that like obviously this specific federal government is completely, you know, ill suited to take on yeah. this well, whole and operation. And, about I, and I get that, but I think what is, and, and I do, I think that like a Biden administration will generally like do better and at least attempt to have a plan that is sort of like structured in a way that will be easier to like get the doses out and for states to follow. Like, yes, I do think that, but like, I think that like I, this, specific situation has like caused me a lot to sort of like think about like not just like our own health infrastructure which we just don't have one of actually but also just sort of like having a, a stronger federal government which i feel like is i feel like so often democrats sort of just like aren't even in favor of and, and like I, it, we've talked about this like over the years on the podcast, like it just sort of you know the difference between the Democrats and the Republicans used to be sort of like strong government and like you know like no government, and I, I just like the Democrats seem to have like stopped even sort of like pushing for like a strong government, and the reason why people the reason why a lot of Democrats don't even want Medicare for all is because a lot of them think that the federal government can't pull off Medicare for all, and that's right. our that's our own fault for like allowing that to be a, a, a thing that people think. So like part of what's wrong with us being able to get vaccines into arms right now is that like nobody even thinks that it can be done because there's there's no there's no federal there's no federal way that it could happen because yeah. like we when have they're really relying on a an assortment of private players to actually distribute them instead of having any sort of central plan. I mean, you noted that Mark Levine, who's the city council member in New York City, has been, he was tweeting like, you know, New York got a lot of um, flack because Cuomo, in an effort to stop people from jumping the line, put in really strict rules about who could and couldn't receive vaccines and they were going to penalize hospitals for giving them to the wrong people. And people ended up having to throw out vaccines because of it, because they weren't allowed to give them to any random person who walked by and they just couldn't find the people that they needed to in a lot of the locations to meet the criteria. And so Mark Levine was tweeting, A, why aren't we vaccinating 24 seven? We are only vaccinating during business hours. That's absurd. Like, would everyone show up at 1 a.m. to get their vaccine? Yes. B, why isn't there a central way to find out where you can get one and how to sign sign up? Like, even if we're going to have all of these individual private players and an assortment of public and private hospitals and whatever um, administering them, why isn't there one central government controlled website where you can put your name on the list? Yeah. I mean, one of the well, most a lot of European that LA County did in the beginning of this crisis was set up a website where all of the disparate private players who you can, you know, who you can get tested through in LA County were available and listed on one central website so that when you went to sign up for a test, you could look at every place you could get a test and just sign up for one of them. But without that, how it would be so hard to find a test without that knowledge, you know, and you would have to check all these different websites. There wouldn't be availability. Like, why aren't we thinking about what infrastructure can make 
access to the information even universal? And then also, why wouldn't we be doing it 24 seven? Right. Well, and, and also, I mean, the, and you know, a lot of European companies, like people have suggested like, oh, there could be an app where you enter your information right. and like and whatever yeah, health issues we have, like, you know, like, yeah, I know, right, real revolutionary, so revolutionary that like many European countries are already doing it this way. But I mean, this Germany is, has this had is, like- continues to be our refusal to learn from other countries. Every yeah, other country has totally. handled this better than us. Every other country developed, yeah. developing, where they've all handled this better than we have. Yeah. I was just reading an article about how everybody thought it was gonna be a disaster in Africa. And I was like, right. no, we, we, we got this because we're not fucking idiots. Every other country, so now we have this vaccine problem. We've got countries that are vaccinating millions of people per day, every country except the UK who thank God for them similar but to us they're, also they're a vaccinating millions of people a day and we could be looking at them and saying hey what is, oh hey they have an app you know what we have Silicon Valley let's fucking build an app and but we refuse to look at other countries and learn I heard yeah. a French just, person the other day complain to me about their vaccine rollout and I was like sir how dare you nope do not <laughs> no. do not contact an American and tell them that France is not handling the vaccine rollout correctly. No. I do not have time for this conversation. <laughs> no, I mean it's just absurd, and it's it's again it's that we we just don't care enough. We well, just and we're obsessed with people deserving things as opposed to just yep. like because listen, I understand why we you know why we do a thing where we like call doctors heroes so that we actually think about them enough to like make sure they have ppe and why we're trying to call grocery clerks heroes so that we actually treat them like people who are doing a hazardous and incredibly important job i also think you know based on my experience with 9 11 that oftentimes that ends up hampering you from being able to see the full scope of a problem and addressing how you can resolve it by actually including everybody in the solution so instead of just worrying that the heroes aren't getting it first we should also be thinking like, well, everyone is important to the functioning of society in some manner. It's well, just we're all we're, get this. Right. And so we're if all we don't have a plan. Right. Let's do it without one. But like, and, let's actually get them into arms. That's the most right. important thing. On and, we're, and we're all part of the community spread issue. Right. I mean, exactly. like, right. Uh, right. I mean, it's what you said at the beginning of this, Lila. You want to protect those heroes. Let's stop people from going to the hospital. Right. right. So yeah, let's just I give mean, it to everybody. I mean, we have, we finally, for somehow we avoided for a while because there was like a three month period when LA decided, sure, we'll care about homeless people. And so what we right. thought was going to be a huge COVID spread at the beginning of the pandemic didn't happen. It's happening now. At the same time, we are like throwing away vaccines because they're going bad. How has nobody in LA County thought, hey, we have these vaccines that are going bad and we have all of these people experiencing homelessness who are dying of COVID, maybe we should give them the right. vaccine. We could literally just drive to we any overpass in the entire city Anywhere. and find hundreds of people we who need to be vaccinated. Echo Park. There is a neighborhood right. of over 100 tents in Echo Park. People live in. We could go there, give every single one of them a vaccine. Or we could go like, to any Latino community. I mean, like, we actually yeah. could do this. We yeah. just don't care. But I, you know, I have this one medical, it's this like concierge doctor thing. I got a free membership with my health insurance and they're sending us regular emails. Hey, you guys, we have vaccines. So if you are part of this thing, you can come by Beverly Hills and get it, blah, blah, blah. I know for a fact that I'll get an email from them and I will very quickly make an appointment on an app and I'll drive over and I'll get a vaccine. I don't, I mean, I want a vaccine because I miss leaving my house, but I am not at risk of dying. And right. they should not have first access to the vaccine. No. LA County should be out giving it to the people who desperately need it. And instead we yeah. just don't care. We just don't care. And there should be penalties for not using all the doses. There should yes. not be penalties for not giving them to the right people. It's like, yeah, yeah, we're already in a situation where no matter how we organize it now, the people most in need are not gonna have first access to it because the people, the communities most in need right now are communities that are underserved by healthcare systems in general. Totally. So. We're not like we're past the point where we can even guarantee an equitable amount of uh, an, e an equitable uh, vaccine rollout. Now, we should aim at the policy level to make it as equitable as we can under the circumstances, obviously. But at a certain point, we should not be concerned about whether people who, you know, when we have 20 vaccine doses and we haven't been able to vet whether people are grocery clerks that we're giving them to, we should not be worried about that if they're going to expire in an hour. We should just be giving them to whoever. It's, it's like the same way that means testing ends up being more expensive and time consuming than just giving people shit. Like, yep. you know, it, it, you see that with um, services geared towards, you know, food and housing insecure people or, you know, food, you know, poverty programs, you see it with the stimulus check. Stimulus All of that yeah. is much more expensive and time consuming than just giving everyone access to shit. And like, at the point that we have no plan, I think our only option is really just to be like, 
well, let's make sure that we, when we're giving these out, are in the communities that need them the most. You know, if we, if we know that Latino Angelinos are three times as likely to get COVID as anyone else in the city, let's set up this tent in a neighborhood that is heavily Latino so that people who are walking by who are getting it are the people that are at most risk. But like, also, we should just be putting them in arms of humans. Yeah, like, don't be hoarding them in, in also, hospitals. Right. The people who are at the most risk for getting COVID are also people who are at most risk for e getting evicted, most risk for losing jobs, whose children are not getting, you know, there are plenty of people in this town, like you'll be a private tutor, you're making a million dollars a year. They're at most risk of having their children not have regular access to the internet, not being able to go to school. So every single thing that we're looking at of the implications of what this is going to do to our economies and our communities, we could fix by just putting a tent in the middle of freaking South LA and giving everybody right. a vaccine and then yep. they can go back to work and they can pay their rent and their kids can go back to school and we can right. solve this problem. And like, look, if a bunch of like rich idiots from north of there drive down there to get the vaccine, Fine. Don't worry about it. Just give them the vaccine too. Like, just give everyone who it's wants exactly the vaccine like the vaccine. The stimulus argument. Exactly. Just fucking give everybody. Just the give money. it to everyone. And either Don't... they'll use it for rent, or they'll use it at a nice restaurant, and a waiter will get paid. But either way, it will do the community good. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, it's wild. Oy. And it's actually wild because the positive test rate in LA is twenty percent, which Ooh. means that one fifth of the people that go and get tests right now in LA are testing positive. It means that it's starting to spread in workplaces like Targets and Costco's and Walmarts and things like that. We've big stores are seeing tons of outbreaks. And hundreds of grocery store workers getting right. it just I in the last few weeks. I can't believe that every set in LA has not been shut down because it's also spreading on set. Well, there's a big push for that. I, there's, yeah, they're trying really hard. I mean, they're nobody. Working. There's just months worth of entertainment on Netflix that you haven't seen yet. Like there, there's <laughs> well, not an emergency. I'm close not me. To the end. <laughs> Thank you. I know. End. Yeah, there, there is You're no movie that needs your TV to be in production right now that is worth it. people. But you buying. know what? There are there are books. That's right. Here's a thing. <sighs> the world, the world. There, there are podcasts. <laughs> like there is other stuff. There's Maybe you're not going to run out of everybody. stuff to do. It's there's you're already stuff. bored in your home. The TV wasn't making it less boring. It's just one of the other things you do to pass time because all you can do these days is pass time. So like, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and especially given that it is the people that are the lowest paid in these environments that are bearing the brunt yes. of this, because right. when you look at the rates broken down by demographic in LA, the difference between the rate among Latino Angelinos and everyone else is like astonishing. I mean, we're talking about it, it, it is more than twice the rate among black Angelinos who are not get, being given stellar access to healthcare in their communities. Like it is more than twice the rate of the rate in white, you know, of white Angelinos. And it is more than three times the rate of the COVID rate in the Asian community. Like it is so much, it's so soaringly high that it feels like uh, instead of obsessing about whether people, you know, with just sort of like some kind of access to healthcare in medical settings are getting it in the right order, we should be going into neighborhoods that are heavily Latino yeah. and literally vaccinating Which whoever, even everybody. if they're not at high risk. Yep. Like, it is at that point where it is not worth asking these questions really. Yeah, yeah. Um, agreed. But so in any case, that's my public health policy that no one's listening to, so. No, cause they're not doing, like Newsom is literally not doing anything. It's not like, if for anyone who li doesn't live in California, like right now we're going through this shocking, shocking, we can't even call it a surge anymore because it's been, it's lasted for like a so sustained long. Like, crisis. Oh, yeah. So bad and the governor's not doing anything, right? He's like, maybe I'll make a plan so we can like go back to school. Like we are vaccinating, we've vaccinated less of our population than Texas. You know, like we are not doing, and they're not talking about it. Garcetti isn't talking about it. Garcetti is trying to figure out like why he didn't get transportation secretary. They're not doing anything at all. And they have not closed retail. They instead said, take oh, you can still shopping. go to the Gap. You can still go to the Gap. Yeah. And they're just hoping you'll take a, a break website. from shopping. I know, but the, the LA County public health director actually said, well, we're going to keep all retail open, but you guys just stay home. Yeah. Like, yeah. And meanwhile, what, this is because of Prop 22, while those workers are also losing protections oh in a lot of these oh retail settings, because there was also a big announcement that Albertsons and a bunch of their subsidiaries, because they own Vons and Pavilions, these are all supermarket chains in Southern California and other places too, I think. Yep. Um, are discontinuing yeah, their in-house delivery services. Those are heavily used because of the crisis. These are union jobs that people mm -hmm. had. They're discontinuing them 
in, um, starting in February so that they can use apps who because of Prop 22 do not have to offer any worker protections or any benefits to their employees. Yep. So they're basically removing union jobs from their roles in a time where it is not grocery stores that are losing money in this crisis, you guys. Mm. They are doing okay. They can afford to pay their union the their delivery money. services. They yeah. are The delivery services are in high demand right now. They're making yeah. plenty of money on this. They have decided though, it will be cheaper to just let DoorDash deal with it. And so instead they're basically farming it out to companies that have a special exemption from labor laws. Yep. Exactly. Well, and they're right, it will be cheaper because they won't have to pay full-time salaries. They won't have to pay yeah, for, right. exactly. for healthcare. They won't have to pay. And they're gonna save trillions of dollars on this totally. while completely wiping out yet yeah, another one of the few protected workforces left in the country. Yeah. Yep. They're pro I'm sure uh, and, and now an incredibly these, high risk one at that. I was gonna say, yeah. And now yes. these drivers yes. are probably just if they want to keep any they're sort of semblance of a job, they're gonna have to become DoorDash people, and now they've lost all of their worker protection. So know, it's working out someone made a really, great for everyone. Someone made a great workers. point because they're like, who's next? FedEx, right? UPS. Yeah. Like this now, what Prop 22 has done is allowed every single company that hires any sort of, uh, that has any sort of employees that can even remotely be turned into gig employees, done. Turn into yeah, them. totally. And well, then I as soon as you turn them into that, they lose all their protections by right. law. Oh, they lose absolutely everything. Yeah. And even, you know, even it, it just really, you're absolutely right. Like, and, but even I would say companies that like can't necessarily turn their people into gig employees also just sort of like now probably have to be thinking like, is the restaurant association thinking about how they can like make sure that like servers aren't getting minimum wage because they're oh, also like yeah. getting tips. Like, you know, I mean, like, there's well, a, and don't think that because you have like an academic job, because I was reading a tip Twitter chain where someone said, that a person doing research at DoorDash was a task rabbiter. Yeah. So, oh you know, if you, if you, That's if meta. we can task rabbit videographers, right? You, you carry a boom for a living. Guess what? We're going to turn that into a gig economy. Like there's no job that we can't turn into a gig job because it's not all delivery. It's yeah. everything. I mean, look at fiber, right? You're a graphic yeah. designer or an editor or whatever else. That's a gig job. We can turn almost everything. We could probably turn nursing into gig jobs, right? And now it basically is. Retired. I mean, what are travel nurses if not essentially yeah, gig yeah. workers? Exactly. There is there are very few positions. I mean, we've basically turned professors into gig jobs. Yeah, right? I've done. professors, right? There are, so I think there are a lot of people who think they're safe because they're like, well, I'm not a delivery. You're not. There is literally nobody no. that is and safe. And that is why yeah. we told Substitute you not to teachers. vote for Prop teachers 22. Are a gig. Yeah, totally. Yeah, teachers are a gig job. The substitute teachers are door dashers. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's yeah. nothing that is safe. I think this is safe. knowing, you know, this is something that they're going to try to roll out in other states and they have to be stopped, mm -hmm. first of all. But second of all, California can act to, re to undo this. Just as this was just a dumb prop that idiots voted on, it can, we can remove it and also a dumb prop that idiots vote on. We can do anything by prop in California that we decide to. That... The way that this law is written, it requires a huge majority to overturn. There yep. is not actually a way to get rid of this policy. Voters were not informed about it when they voted on it because it was there were so many lies coming from the incredible amount of advertising that it's not like two hundred million dollars, I think. Um, yeah, put on TV, and so no one understood what it was. And I just to be clear with everyone who feels hopeless about this because I have been feeling hopeless about it. We can undo it too. We. We can vote on a prop that undoes this. We don't have to allow yeah, special exemptions from our work. Here's why we're not going wise. to, because this is going to absolutely shoot the market into the stratosphere, right? Because Albertsons is about to yeah. make trillions more dollars. Yeah. So their stock is going to be worth more. Like the more that they do this, the more that the market is rewarded. And so then they have more money. They can, DoorDash and Uber and all that, they can easily spend another 200 million on another campaign. So, I mean, I'm glad you have yeah, this no, I mean. Hope. But, but this is something I that I think that we have to continue to act on so that we don't forget that it's un, that, it, that we can undo it too. It cannot be like um, Prop 13, where we just never get rid of it ever, even though we try every year to get rid of everything. You know, like I, it has to be something that we continue to vote on every single year so that everyone has a chance to learn what it meant. I see what you mean. 
Yeah. Like, like dialysis, which I think almost everybody in the state of California is an expert on now. Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, I we voted for that. Every if year you have time. questions as a non-Californian about the dialysis <laughs> market, about how dialysis companies operate, about their profit uh, margin, <laughs> ask a Californian because we all have PhDs in dialysis. Yep. Oh my God. Oh, man. I don't know a single person who's on dialysis, <laughs> but I could not know more about the financial side of the dialysis industry <laughs> than I do. I, um, you know, I think that, that my really big concern about this, I mean, along with everything else, is that we are right now at a point where everyone's been fired from their jobs yeah. and employers right now have an opportunity to think about how they're restructuring for post COVID. Yeah. And right now they're seeing, Oh, we don't actually have to hire those people back. Like they've already seen we well, you can work from home so we can save money on office space, which, Hey, I told, I think it's great. It's not like the kids need to go back to school because all of my employees are losing their minds, but like, you know, but I think they're all looking at this and they're realizing, Oh, we actually never have to bring those people back. Yeah. We can turn yeah. to give yep. work. And so what, what does 2022 look like when we have an economy where even formerly white collar steady jobs have been turned into gig jobs? What, how, are, how is this going to completely reshape our economy? Yeah. Yep. No, and it's, it's only going to further the, the very divides that created this horrible political moment that we are in right now. Absolutely. Yeah. Now on the bright side, Absolutely. Everybody who's under the age of 30 is a Marxist. So at some point, it'll shift <laughs> yes. again. There you go. Because, yes. Because of all the Marxists. Everybody on TikTok. Um, yeah. Exactly. Until that point, though, um, we have to live in a world in which the, there were terrible job losses in December. The economy lost 140,000 non-farm payroll jobs. Women accounted for 156,000 of those jobs, which means men gained 16,000 jobs and women accounted for all of the job losses, including extra ones that had not been even part of the job loss discussion. And I, that, and those losses more specifically were felt by black and Latina women who made up almost entire, the almost, if not the entire of the job losses, most of it. I have seen some competing stats about that, but I mean, this is, I have never seen a jobs report that just casually reported that women accounted for all of the losses. All of the job. This is my yeah. second coup. After I coup, yeah. <laughs> like all of the cabinet picks, we're doing another coup over this. I'm so, I, I said this to every woman I know yesterday. I am like absolutely raging. This is I, I, I honestly, I still can't form words because I'm so angry about this. I'm so angry. It's, it is. I mean, if you are somebody who is already stressed out about the financial toll that this pandemic has taken on all low wage work, on a lot of middle class workers, on just like every person who's in the world, like just like this is like such an unacceptable addendum to that conversation because it shows exactly what, you know, we worried at the very beginning of this crisis, people warned about this. They said these losses are going to be disproportionately felt by women. They're going to be disproportionately felt by Black and Latina women specifically. We warned about this. There was no effort made to do anything about it. And now we're seeing a month of terrible job losses report that the entire loss is account is women. Like, what the fuck, you guys? I know. Well, and also, I mean, it's it, like... I'm not, I don't say this in a mean to downplay the fact that they were all women, but also just in terms of the economy broadly, this is the first month that there were even losses since May when we started adding jobs back. And most economists thought that that was going to continue through December. Yeah. So like just big picture, like it's, this is not what people thought was going to be happening with job losses because we had been while well, obviously things have slowed and it's stagnant like uh, and you know nobody thinks the economy is going gangbusters right now we had been at least after all of those like you know months where we had like millions of job losses like um we had been adding back so like it, it's just but even so women were getting added back mostly with part-time yes. and low-wage yeah. jobs totally yes over 100%. two million women have yep. lost jobs since february mostly yep. black and latino and yep. when women are getting jobs back they're not good jobs like that's why you have these horrible job numbers but sixteen thousand men 
gain jobs. Gain jobs. Because somehow. when people are hiring, they're hiring men and they're hiring white men. Yep. Yeah. The the white the white male uh, unemployment rate is five point eight percent right now, and for black women, it's eight point four, and Latina women, it's nine point one. Yeah. I just read uh, an article about Louisiana, uh, where black blacks make up. Uh, a third of Louisiana's population, but 60% of their unemployed. That is God. wild. That and is those, not, like, if we're, if we're looking state by state, if we're looking nationally, if we're looking at these numbers, if we're looking at, you know, true unemployment, like, this is a really shocking statistic, this women losing all jobs in December, but it is just one small picture, yeah. one small slice of how bad job numbers really are for women and for women of color and for people of color in this country yeah. right now. And again, the recovery is It'll going come. to be so much worse because <laughs> yeah. first men are going to get hired when we have all of those gig jobs, right? The only people who have a job in an office with health insurance are going to be white men. Everybody else is going to be doing gig jobs. We already know that even within those jobs, there's such massive racism that you know, drivers of color have lower stars and get worse assignments and less tips and et cetera, et cetera. Like this is completely rocked the, any gains that we've had over yeah. the last few years and women being unemployed and equality, you know, and black and Latina women starting to, to be able to get jobs that are even like marginally paying close to what other people are getting paid. This has just wiped it all out. Well, and it hampers our ability to have a, a robust recovery in the first place because we know how hard it is to get people back into the job market if these are if the losses are felt disproportionately by certain communities it becomes even harder to get like whole communities back on their feet after a crisis it has trickle down effects to every aspect of life in communities all over the country because if you don't have a job then you don't have you know robust retail in your in your area you don't have stable housing in your area you don't have you know your kids don't have internet in your area i mean there's all of these other ways in which the the loss is being disproportionately felt by only some communities hampers any ability to to rehab those communities when the when the money and the jobs and the life and the covid goes away and the come people come back and whatever like it makes it so much harder because we end up building back from nothing yeah. as opposed to well and the people who are more likely to hire Blacks and Latinas are, you know, it's going to take much longer for Black right. and Latino small businesses, small which businesses. Have, have absolutely been decimated to come back. I'm a Black employer and I get funded, you know, Black or women of color get like 0.6% of all foundation funding or something, right? I get yeah. funded at such a smaller rate than other organizations that even though I may be more likely to hire women or people of color, I'm not going to be able to hire as many because I get less money. And so you're not just looking okay. at, you know, when you're looking at, at both the people who just the regular world won't hire, right? But also the fact that because the community has been decimated across so many ways, also it, we've had more people right. die. There's right. just fewer of us now. Right. There weren't a lot of us to begin with. And now there are fewer of us because we're dead. And like, I was just reading an article about this black man who had to use his rent money to pay for his wife's funeral because oh she died of COVID. So now he's being evicted, right? Like these things impact us so much more. We had to pay for more funerals this time around. We we have higher medical bills, right? So all right. of these- And already things, are less likely to have health insurance that exactly. in the first place and, if, and beyond that, effective health insurance, if you have it at all. I mean, stats show again and again that people of color and specifically black people are less likely to have health insurance than anyone else. So, I mean, these are, are, these are compounding problems. Right, and this, this is the thing, they just, they add up and they add up. You never find, you know, a person who, is experiencing homelessness who has no other problems. That's their only problem, right? right? You don't have a person who is unemployed who they're like, no, life's fine. I've got a house. I've got health insurance. I just don't have a job, right? Like the all of these things add up. And what we're you find a lot of people like that in that, Williamsburg. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> there are certain parts of the country, Silver Lake, Williamsburg, and right. certain pockets of Chicago. But like, the, you know, the, this is the problem: is that all of the everything was. I mean, just like we were just talking about with vaccines. We need mm -hmm. people, yeah. Latino, and the Latino community to get vaccines because they need homes and jobs. It's, it's all adding up to this, this, you know, this bubble where at some point the country just can't yeah. sustain this anymore. Yeah.
And we don't have an administration coming in that's going to be particularly forward looking, looking on a lot no, of these issues. Because in a situation like this, where a crisis is hitting people disproportionately in a community from different, from this many different angles, you know, like at a certain point, you have to be willing to give them stuff without worrying if they personally deserve it. Like, I mean, that goes back to our sense that everyone has to deserve any help that we give. And like, there is no way for like a community in LA, for example, that is suffering, you know, disproportionate job losses because it is a community that's predominantly Latino and is, you know, already was more likely to be in jobs that didn't pay, um, didn't pay well and weren't stable. And then also has three times the rate of COVID as everyone else. And, all, you know, like has all of those things. There is no way to sort of like disentangle those things like you're saying. And so the solution is just to like give services indiscriminately. The solution is not to worry about broad, you know, specific categories of need, but worry about broad categories of need. And we have an administration coming in that doesn't believe in that, you know, that doesn't believe well, you in know, doing like, that kind of thing. I've been reading about states that uh, have decided that they're not going to vaccinate undocumented people. Why right. are they not oh, yeah. contagious? Right? Like, they can't, right, they're yeah. not humans who can get diseases. Like what? Yeah. And who can spread it to people who right. are citizens? Like it's so stupid. Like when yeah. our our ignorance and racism gets to a point where we're like, oh, you know what? I'm not going to vaccinate this undocumented person, and then they're going to get on a bus with my daughter. But somehow there's this magical invisible wall around them that no right. like viruses can escape. No, just fucking so give crazy. them the vaccine because by that you're protecting the people you care about. If you, yeah. right. you know, maybe you don't think that person's a human being, but you think you are and viruses don't care yeah no that well and that's i think well, clearly like, these I, people don't understand public health i mean well i was gonna say like, also i well, think this is part of the kind of larger science theoretical <laughs> or science, yeah. that we have where like what i always see as i see that anything that invests in people that need help to be a benefit to just my life personally because it is like better to live in a society where some people aren't super desperate and hungry and camped outside my house. And it is better to live in a society where no one has to steal from me because they have enough food. And it is better to live in a society where yeah. every single kid that my kid goes to school with is taken care of so that everyone at the school is just there to learn and not there to like act out whatever horrifying trauma they're dealing with at home. Like these are all things that benefit your whole community even if you don't feel like you're personally receiving cash in your pocket. but. Like, I think Americans are really bad at seeing the larger implications of letting whole communities bear the brunt of, of bad policy and, and of, of selfish decision making. And I, I don't know how you explain to them why this is bad for them personally. I think on some level, like, it would be helpful if there was messaging coming from the left that was like, actually, it's not just about being a good person. Like, it is selfishly because you care about yourself too. Like, it's easy to justify socialism on a selfish you know, as a selfish prerogative by just thinking in terms of how you want your life to look when you leave your house. But we are like really bad at that too. So we, we lack like the kind of empathy that actually ends up being empathy for ourselves in policy. And mm. it, it's not even, it's not like a smart way of running an economy. It's not a smart way of living in a society. It's not a smart way of thinking about literally any kind of public health measure you know any yeah. kind of public health policy like it's it's actually dumb on every level but you know we're doing it so what can we do <laughs> we, we are absolutely doing it i remember i was in detroit when they were going on one of their many uh sort of rampages shutting off everybody's water who couldn't pay for it and oh. i i couldn't understand so it's like well we know that when you shut down the water of just one household much less communities that the rise of disease is right. immediately significant and disease can actually cross into your gated community. So how do the people who are totally fine with water being shut off, not worried about the plague coming to their house? <laughs> like, right. It's just, it's so logical. Yeah. And yet we over and over and over and over yeah. again miss it and then wonder why we're all dying. Right, yeah. it's like be selfish. Think about politics selfishly. Right. It's right. if you the more the, the more selfishly you think about them, the easier it is to justify, you know. Look, being the Gordon of Gordon Gecko of health policy. Yeah. I, no, yeah. I just I don't know how much longer we can we can go on like this. Yeah. I know. 
One thing that we can't continue to do any longer is not charge people who shoot just like innocent black people just like out and about in the world. Um, but we got news this week as if this week wasn't a crazy enough thing with the imagery of like p police opening the doors of the Capitol for white supremacists after we've watched all summer as like riot cops showed up to peaceful crowds at BLM protests and like pepper sprayed them for standing places. Um, but the, uh, the Jacob Blake killer is uh, not he's alive, I think, charged. isn't he? What? Isn't he, isn't he alive? Yeah, no, he's paralyzed. He's alive. Yeah, oh, sorry. The Jacob Blake, oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, I mentioned yeah, 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 him. Yeah, I mean. They handcuffed him to his hospital bed while he was paralyzed. Well, paralyzed. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. The shooter. I think he got um, shot like seven times too or something. I mean, the yeah. attempted murderer. Yeah. Right. And he is a paralyzed man now. So yes. it, he's a paralyzed person. Um, uh, but the police officer that shot him is not going to be charged because why would we, why would we do that when, why we, why we do that? you know, who is currently being suspended from their job is the police officer that shot that lady who was trying to like break into the house chambers by climbing through a window with an angry mob that was like literally like smashing, you know, the wind, the smashing at the cop with spikes. But like that guy, they took right off because they have to investigate, obviously, but we can't even charge people that have like openly been murdering people. Apparently that's, that's too much to ask. I don't know. I, I don't know I how am, we decide. I, well, we do because white I mean, people, you can't kill white people. I know exactly how we decide. Right. Yeah, yes. exactly. I, mean, I don't know I why we, we decide. <laughs> I think that I'm at the point where I, I don't know how they're not thinking about the optics of this. Right? Like, fine. No, you, you don't care about us dying, et cetera. But you know, I always wonder how they're still doing things like, you know, the Hollywood reporter will have a cover for the young Hollywood and they'll all be white. And I always wonder how did nobody in this room or any of the publicists say, hey, people are gonna really shit on us for this. Maybe you should find one brown person to put in here. Well, not because also, we care, not because we want to feature them, but because, because they want their clients. Media. They need right. their clients to not look like assholes. Exactly. Because People. we know social media is going to lose their mind. So let's just go find a black person, put them in here. Everybody's happy. And they never do that. And then they constantly get trash for it. And they keep doing it over and over. And I just feel like at this point, why aren't any of these you know, prosecutors or judges just saying, you know, because there's also uh, the guy who plowed into the protesters in whatever yes. state. He also oh, got yeah, I forgot to add that. Right? And I'm just like, at what point? Are these prosecutors and judges thinking like, look, I don't care. I totally think you should be able to kill black people, but I know that it's going to look really bad. There's going to be protesters. People are going to be really angry. My name is going to be trashed on, in the internet for the rest of history. So I'm going to have to put you in jail for a few years. Like I'm, I, I am beyond the point of ever thinking there's that anyone's going to care that there's ever going to be real social justice, but you guys for the optics for right. the PR make a different choice. Also just for the sake, like, I think on, a, on another level too, I'm sort of like, if you are having racist thoughts in your head, like obviously I can't do anything about that, but like it is still better for the PR to take a dangerous cop off the streets. And then also we all benefit and you didn't have to stop having racist thoughts in your head to do that. You just had to think, how did this look? But yeah. at least it actually is good for everyone. So like you're you able to take- still go home and like put on your white hood and make your macaroni right. and cheese from a box and and be totally happy but then in public people will think that you're an okay dude based on the standards of the time you can do as anderson cooper would put it you can eat at olive garden they're not making stay their stay own holiday inn. stay at the yeah. holiday inn <laughs> 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 and oh, man. go about your life and privately know that you're a racist and no one even has to know about it and and yeah, you're fine. No, I just, I, that's 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 where I am. Yeah. Um, we ask so little these days. There was God. There was some. I, there was some. I, yes. oh, there was some good CNN shade this week. By the way. Oh my God. There CNN was, uh, is Anderson. over Done. it. What clip did I send to you of um of Jay Tapper? Oh right, talking about the nuttery from the fever swamps. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, did you say they had a Chiron at one point that just said because dot 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 of course. <laughs> <laughs> There's like, seeing it yeah, is gotten like really <laughs> sassy. Yeah, so good. Yeah, and I saw at oh, one man. point Chris Cuomo and Don Lemon got into an argument about whether or not to show graphic footage of that woman being shot because yes. Don Lemon yes. was like, you do this all the time for black people and then you think people are too sensitive to watch a white woman get shot, but like, just show it. We see black death constantly on TV and no one says anything about it. 
And then they had an argument about whether they were the ones with the power to show it or not. And it was like a long exchange that they had amongst themselves while on live air where they weren't even looking at the camera. They were just sort of like having a bickering match. And I was just like, these people have not taken naps today. I was just about to say, they're all very tired. (laughs) (laughs) And then also, well, so there was an interview with George Conway, uh, like on Friday that, and listen, I don't approve of George Conway, but he did say exactly what I had been saying, which is we should exercise every single removal option for Trump. We shouldn't just be like, you should impeach and then have them, the, you know, the cabinet be like, or the, the house be like, no, you should, you know, invoke the 25th and then argue about who should do what. Instead, we should just all do all of it. And <laughs> I've been saying that- We remove the Conway children from the Conway household. That's the only thing I want to hear about. But Conways, Claudia noted abused. on TikTok later that night that George had also just said he was leaving the family. Right. He so, left the family and then went and made excellent points on CNN. That's, that's uh-huh. right. That's the George Conway life. And then Claudia Conway was like, good riddance. You've taught us to be independent because you've never been present right. in the first place. Good and I was like, I don't know what's going on with them, but somebody needs to take her in and get her some help. Um, <laughs> the coup has been officially declared a super spreader event. And not just because the people who were doing the coup weren't wearing masks, but because they took like a hundred members of Congress to a room downstairs together and the Republicans in the room were refusing to wear their masks. When people were begging them, like old people, because half of Congress is 285 years old and they were begging Republicans to wear masks and they were like, no, fuck you, die. National treasure And look, I feel that way like theoretically about Congress people, but I don't actually feel that way. Like I'm going to wear a mask, but I also would really like you to be voted out, die by, but I'm not going to actually murder you. I'm going to try to kill you myself. I like Lindsey Graham while he had COVID. So she was a bad example. (laughs) (laughs) She was, yeah. She's actively trying to get it. Don't fool around like that when you have National right. Treasure Pramila Jayapal in your room with you. Like, right. where are you I fucking mean, mad? My God. Yeah. Like, was I not a Presley in there? I, mean, I don't know. I, oh God. I I did note Pramila Jayapal said, you know, she was in the House Gallery. She gave the in that interview with Rebecca Tracer. She said she was in the House Gallery when the when they broke in. You know, when they started they broke into the House and because there was not enough security presence up there with them, they didn't have a way of evacuating for like an mm-hmm. hour. So they were actually ducked behind the seats when that shooting and when the gun pointing started to break out. Like when people pulled yeah. guns inside of the house chamber, Congress members were still in there upstairs lying in the, you know, in the, uh, the floor um, with, with gas masks on because they didn't have a way of getting them out. But she was like, she did say like, you know, I was up there. I immediately had to look around because I had to make sure none of the squad was up there with me because I knew that those people were going to come for them and I needed to make sure that they were blocked. And so that she was like spent the whole time as she is like a person with like who had, you know, a knee replacement and had to walk down like six flights of stairs to get to safety. And it was like a whole mess. Um, But she spent the whole time being like, I had to make sure that the squad was safe because I knew that they would be the target if these people got in. Yeah, because Republicans have actively put their lives at danger for years. Yep. They, if any of them had died, it would be the fault of every single Squarely. Republican who has actively called for them yes. to be injured. Yep. Squarely on the heads of the Republican caucus. Yep. Totally. Um, yep. But the, the idea that she had to think that way when her own life was in danger is so horrifying also. Just like mm-hmm. she is herself a national treasure. We can't And now having her. she might have COVID because of a bunch of dicks who wouldn't wear masks. Exactly. Yeah. No, the whole thing is just a disaster. Oh, yeah. The week, the week has been chaotic, though, all week because it ended with Trump getting kicked off of Twitter finally, which led him on like a they, they ended up on this like crazy <laughs> whack a mole chase through Twitter where he got kicked off Twitter and then he tried to sign on to like three different accounts and Twitter kept shutting those accounts down as he got onto them. And then um, finally, I think, and then they also tried to release his tweets as a press release at one point because they were like weren't sure what to do if they couldn't release tweets. Um, he also got kicked off of other platforms. He got kicked off Facebook first. I have to say, Zuckerberg is like not interested in Donald Trump at the moment. Yeah, fuck Instagram him. And, Instagram and Facebook were yeah, the first he gets services no for this. to, yeah. I mean, no, I mean, fuck him. But I mean, right. like, obviously he is somebody who has already started talking to the Biden administration. So he was just yes, like, 100%. fuck this guy. Yeah. Um, and not because he's, he's a great American, programs. but just because he's got business interests elsewhere. They, they um, just, they reset his microchips to be, you know, to set his allegiance to the next administration. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that's... Exactly. Um, but so he got kicked off Facebook and Instagram first. Twitter was real slow to the game, but after Twitter banned him, like all sorts of hilarious services started banning him, like Spotify banned him, and then Pinterest banned uh-huh. him. Pinterest! Which is no gluten-free recipe boards for Trump. 
<laughs> <laughs> and then also the email vendor for the Trump campaign list just suspended them so they can't um, send their Trump oh, campaign emails. I didn't Amazon is kicking Parler off their hosting and they were Apple taken out of the has. Google and Apple store. Yep. Um, yeah. So suddenly- and so has Google. Yeah. yeah. So, so they're dead. So Parler is a mess right now. Suddenly the right cares very deeply about um, stopping private companies from discriminating against people, like we said earlier, but it doesn't seem to be yep. uh, working that well. We should um, send them all gay cakes. Mm -hmm. I know. Yeah. <laughs> and so what is Trump decided to, well, first he announced that he was going to probably hire Giuliani, or it got announced that he was going to probably hire Giuliani and Alan Dershowitz to represent him at the impeachment trial, which is like winning plan, comedy gold. Sure. Um, <laughs> what did the Trump administration decide that they were going to do to change the narrative next week? Well, basically infrastructure week. One we're last oh my God. We're one beginning last infrastructure the way week. that we have it. They're going to we'll take a trip. Have infrastructure we'll always have infrastructure week. <laughs> <laughs> they begin, they're going to use the week to take a trip down memory lane to visit all of his greatest successes. He's going to the wall on Tuesday. Um, well, that's so, his only success. Yeah. So he's just. I know, I'm to curious to see what wall. other locations they can find to point to a success. And the other portions of the wall. Right. <laughs> just like along the border to Mexico. Oh, he's just traveling <laughs> through, this, through the border states. Yeah. But um, yeah, so we're going we're gonna to have... Uh, something that is basically infrastructure week one last time i want i want merch that says we'll always have infrastructure week yeah, <laughs> we somebody... could be making that merch you could that's I our millions but well, we got to do go. it, it i mean we got to we got to find a graphic designer because that's where we always get <laughs> in these situations <laughs> so I what do we do one. oh daniel your international fan from oh, yeah. Seoul, brilliant graphic designer perfect oh my God, so, all coming together. we've got the team in place already <laughs> We got to, we got to do it. We got to have yeah. also, I want all of my things to say, we'll always have infrastructure. Week. <laughs> yeah. I want a hat. I want a shirt. I want a bag. I want socks. I want all mm -hmm. of it. Forehead tattoo. Forehead tattoo. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Tote. Any of it. A tote. Oh, you gotta um, have a tote. You have to. <laughs> so, oh man. Hopefully we survive the next, you know, 10 days. It seems like it's going to be an adventure. And we always said it would be an adventure. Trump always has a trick up his sleeve. I think I would implore the House Democrats and the Senate Democrats, really, to think about one thing on the way out, which is something that I talked about briefly on the last podcast, but I feel like it should be the final thing that we remind them of, which is that Trump's actions are predictable and foreseeable always. Yes. So don't get caught off guard when he does something crazy. You <laughs> already know what the possibilities are because you have spent four years being shocked by what are entirely predictable outcomes of his heinous behavior. Mm -hmm. Don't be shocked this time. Just be ready. Be ready. Yep. That's, that's all, that's, that's the way to do it. Don't let him surprise you because he can't, he's not capable of surprising anyone because he's not a genius. Well, occasionally he surprises himself. Well, <laughs> that's true. And that's fair. This, the one person Donald Trump is capable of surprising is himself. Um, but don't let any of this make you feel like you can't figure out what he's up to because you literally in your heart know what he's up to. Always. <laughs> yes. Always. Yes, exactly. Oh, man. That's the news this week, you guys. There you go. Thanks, Kat. I mean, look, RIP dry January. We tried, and then there was... Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, did. that was always... I, I was shocked by the number of people that told me they were doing dry January this January. I was like, do dry February. It's a shorter month. And yeah. you don't have, Donald Trump won't be the president anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, so, I didn't think that through. I should have, time. but I really didn't. <laughs> it, was a, it was a time. It's okay to give up. It's okay it to give Fridays. up when things, yeah. No one, no one would be curious as to why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but thanks for so much for coming on. Yes. That's thanks for having me. Always a Anytime. Blast. Anytime. Um, yes. And we will talk Where, to... Do you have any... Last time we were talking about the election and people could volunteer and donate to you. Do you want to give us... Do you want yeah, any... Do you have any you know, actions sure. anyone should take? Yeah. So uh, we're doing a lot. You know, spread the vote. We always get IDs three out of six, five days a year um, right now. So fun fact, uh, I probably said the last time I was here because I'm always talking about the fact that many, many places require ID to get COVID tests. Well, now they're requiring ID to get vaccines. Yay. Um, and so this is, it's, an, it's just, 
you know, the ID issue is just always one that matters. Because again, the same people who have all the other issues we talked about are also less likely to have ID. Um, and we're now starting to get people who are, are coming to us and saying they're requiring an ID to get a vaccine. So we're always just working really hard. So um, you can go to spreadthevote.org slash donate um, and donate to help us out with that. We are still working virtually for the most part. So you can volunteer at spreadthevote.org slash volunteer and what volunteering looks like will just depend on sort of what phase of the COVID we are at. Um, we also have our C4 Project ID Action Fund of which Lila is an integral part of the team. Um, and uh, we are right now preparing to endorse some of the really kick-ass progressive uh, down ballot candidates that are running for some of these mayoral positions, city councils and different things. Um, so you can go to projectid.org and donate or volunteer there. And there'll be opportunities to uh, volunteer with some great candidates and some different things. Um, we're also going to be working on trying to push uh, local and state governments not to require IDs for vaccines. We'll see how that goes, but we're gonna try because it shouldn't be a thing. Um, so yeah, you could go to spreadthevote.org or projectid.org um, and please support because we're we're trying to help and, um, and make sure that, you know, our big thing is, look, I, I'm not going to be able to change the federal government right now. So if I can make sure that people have the thing they need to be able to access uh, life-saving vaccines or jobs, uh, you need an ID to be a gig worker, actually. <laughs> um, you need it for everything. So uh, so we're working really hard. We all came back to work um, on Monday and I are really starting to build out plans and strategies to see and help as many people as possible. I, you know, for the next 15 years that we have this pandemic, because I don't believe it's going away anytime soon. Yeah. <laughs> Cats prepared for the worst. We'll put all of those links in the show notes as well so that you, I don't know, don't have to learn to spell Remember simple stuff? words or whatever <laughs> would be the hold up. I don't know. Um, but we'll have all that information in the show notes. <laughs> and we will talk to you guys next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.